Hump Day right here on 710 Canyon West. George Brockler with you for the next Count em Out Loud. One, two, three, four hours. You are at the front end of the excitement. This is in many ways the best hour of the show. It is, in, it is also, interestingly, the most and least scripted part of the show all at the same time. Now, I have a chance right now because Blake, who helps set up the YouTube thing, has allowed me to see me in the camera. Now, I know Mark Crowley doesn't want me to see me because I think he's afraid I'll get trapped in there like it's a mirror or something, but that's not true. It just, it reminds me not to do things like disrobe on the camera, not to go nostrobating, if you know what I'm talking about, like two knuckles in, that kind of thing. Uh, But when I'm referring to that, what I'm telling you is there is a YouTube channel out there and uh, you'd be doing us a huge solid. If you haven't done it yet, you're probably not doing yourself any favors because when you see Billy and I, you begin to question your imagery of us just based on the voice. Like my guess is you hear me, you're instantly picturing like, I don't know, like a Brad Pitt, maybe a George Clooney. And it's better than that, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to overflay. If you see, if you hear Billy, you're instantly picturing, I don't, what do you think, Billy Halle Berry? I I mean, what? Oh, absolutely. Definitely Halle. And, and unfortunately then when they see me on the YouTube, it's, it's it's a problem. I, I look like a uh, an escaped Bigfoot that somebody has shaven and fed too many donuts. <laughs> is it to. shaven, shaved, or shaved? Shorn. No, let's do shorn. shorn? Yes. Is it shorn? Shorn is much better. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the disappointment. Yeah, the 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 problem is that you're like, oh oh, that's what the oh, that's so disappointing. <laughs> it's just yeah, yeah. yeah like the number one comment I get is I can't believe he's married, and I'm like, I know, I appreciate it too. I I, I respect that, and I think to a woman, I think obviously yeah, we're that concerned about that. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing that we're gonna have to do the next iteration of this is to be able to superimpose other talking heads on us oh yeah and i don't know if we it has to filters. be an animated cat yeah, yeah i don't know if it has filters. to be a yeah. cat or something a cat like face, that a dog face that's what i need that's right that helped me a lot that really would help out i think my point here is pretty please with youtube on top go out there and search for 710k in us and the george brockler show and join the growing number of people who have foolishly subscribed and sent this to their social media distribution list i don't care if it's from five to five jillion kim kardashian if you're listening yeah. uh but that would be hugely helpful to us and it would keep mark from coming in here every day to simply just voice his concern yeah. that i'm not pushing the youtube thing hard yeah. enough tell us how disappointed he is in us yeah, yeah. And, i mean that before youtube he said that but uh, now yeah, well, I get that it's just day. it's just another yeah. bullet on the list well honestly deserved, but yes listen let's talk a little weather here i know you heard it at the top of the hour but there are changes afoot here Remember, again, I'm still not a believer that there's anything related to science involved in the prediction of weather because it changes daily, hourly, you know, weekly, monthly, or yearly. Um, and I can't sing the rest of that because that's a really, really rough song. But nonetheless, um, today, Wednesday, the prediction is 47 degrees. This is from our friends at uh, Denver 7. Yesterday, it was three degrees higher at 50. But here's what we see. Thursday, they've dropped their prediction yesterday from 38 to today's 32. But if you look at Saturday, they've boosted it up to 58. Now, to put that in perspective, folks, just two days ago, they predicted that Saturday would be 48 degrees. They've increased that by 10 degrees. And as you know from the climate extremists out there, a 10 degree change in temperature on the planet Earth eradicates all life. So, uh, good luck there. And so then, you're saying that we are involved in weather inflation. I, uh, something is, there's or, something going on, but, like but deflation okay. today and tomorrow. Yeah. Like I, hmm. I don't understand what's happening with weather. But more yeah. to the point, I don't think they understand what's happening with weather. No, it's, not at uh, all. Yeah. Have we heard back from any of the uh, any of the folks we've reached out to to try to get them on air? Because I'm interested in continuing this scrutiny. Not recently. I will reach out yet again to uh, the uh, KCNC people and see if they have someone that can join us. But I have a feeling that they unfortunately went back into the archives and listened to the previous two interviews and said, <laughs> hard pass. Yeah. I'm well, so guessing. far, no career has been ended. No. Maybe Which I'm a little disappointed. In. Maybe staggered a bit, but yeah. not ended. Uh, something else too, and that is, have we heard back from the AG's office? <laughs> <laughs> Last email I got was just the middle finger. <laughs> You're number one, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's that little kid that's like, nah, giving you the finger. That's, I that's don't it understand. Yeah. It feels like, and I and I want to be clear about this. And I did this as an elected official. Yeah. 
you always go to the places that don't like you because you always. can't lose listeners or votes. You know what yeah. I mean? You cannot lose any more than that unless you're afraid of your ability to think on your feet. And I get it. Um, what's the risk, man? Yeah. What's the risk? You're going to be asked a question you don't want to answer. You're going to have to fake some technological difficulty and the phone disconnects. I mean, what is it? Yeah. It's like, oh, I'm going through a tunnel. I've done. Yeah. It's, uh, that's thing. Like, yeah. Um, I don't understand it either. Well, we'll just keep periodically reaching out. And frankly, we'll at some point, Billy, just send out one that says, we'd love to have you on to talk about anything <laughs> yeah. you want. <laughs> anything Sports, at all. Sports, family, yeah. weather. We don't care. Just please. Yeah, I Get never understood that. It's, it's like everybody that has played competitive sports, uh, you understand that you can only scrimmage yourself so often and then you stop getting better. You need to be exposed to competition. I don't understand this uh, aversion on both sides of the I aisle get it. for going into yeah, yeah. the other place, the other people. Yeah, let's be clear. Yeah. This isn't a Democrat yeah, thing. No, this is not a Democrat. This is a no. politician thing. Yeah, it's a politician thing. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking Across of politicians, of course, uh, yesterday, um, and this morning, I subjected myself to the SOTU, the State of the Union address by our president. I, I have to, one for one, I have to raise my hand and say I'm super impressed that you showed up today, this morning, completely stone cold sober. Because if I would have had to start listening to that thing this early in the morning, it would have been like, where is the damn tequila? Well, it started just, last night. Like yeah, I just, thought, just one for daddy, just yeah, to make sure we can get this through. I'm this not going to subject yeah. anyone oh. else to the State of the Union. So, you know, I crawled into bread, fired up the little AirPod yeah. and started listening to it. And by the way, I think I found another cure for that insomnia, that <laughs> sleeplessness. I, I did that, too. I listened to it live and I nodded off at one point. I had to go back. I, <laughs> yeah. So I listened a bunch. Yeah. I tried yeah. to uh, it, weird behind the scenes stuff. I tried to shoot Billy some. Hey, here's some time hacks. They yeah. were all jacked up for the video that I sent. Which and again leads me to believe you were drinking then, and that's good, which I appreciate. I don't think I was, but I may have gone Tylenol PM. Okay, that's I don't, good but I don't yeah. think I needed to based Start on doing the those Nyquil shots. So then I woke <laughs> up uh, as yeah. I want to do because I'm a horrible sleeper, have oh, been yeah, for probably too. twelve years. Yeah. Um, I uh, I wake up at like three something, and I crush the rest of the State of the Union and listen to the Sarah Huckabee Sanders thing. By the way, texters here, and I, I got to say this because people are already texting in. Yeah, yeah. You can always text us off the app 710KNUS.com or, or, or the app 710KNUS. Here's one. Friendly grammar correction. When you see Billy, I think they mean when you see Billy and me, when you see me, not when you see. Yeah, uh, right there. This may be a texture who's drinking, too. I, I'm I not just, sure I know what you're saying. You're probably going to have to call in at 303-696-1971. I think what Hickam, Hick got them in the hiccup is the disrobing comment. I think what they they're, they're mad about is not seeing more of you and I. I think what they're hoping for is, you know, something like No Shirt Friday, which is not going to happen, but I'm just... No, it I'm could happen, but the YouTube will be disconnected. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. picture will be down. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. and I will be able yeah. to enjoy each other's 50-plus-year-old yeah, yeah. bodies. This is not for sharing. No, <laughs> no, no. Well, <laughs> no, 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 it's know, not. <laughs> unless you made a foolish decision years ago to share. <laughs> yeah, this uh, is not for no. That's it yeah. right there. Um, but did, did you watch? Unfortunately, yeah. The and, whole and, thing and the yeah. Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Yeah, thing. I did. And again, I fell asleep during part of it with Biden. And it's funny because my uh, my oldest son was there with me. And because he has a very I, I love him because he has a very acerbic approach to politics. <laughs> he, um, I appreciate him. And he's just more angry than I want him to be at times about politicians. And it's fantastic. But I fell asleep and then I woke up part of the way through and, and he says, Welcome back. He goes, you didn't miss anything. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, he, he, like I did, um, found the most enjoyment from the people yelling and screaming on the floor. I just, I think that, fine, let's just go all the way to England. Let's just yell and scream at each other all the time. Either we got to decide that we're going to, during these events, yell, scream, and do all sorts of stuff like that, or we're going to behave like adults and sit and listen to the person that is speaking and then applaud at the appropriate times and not applaud. And uh, yeah, but the yelling and screaming, we got to either go all in or, or, forget about it and the other part that i look at is my my son um looks at this and again i just i love his his perception sometimes he yeah. sits there and he goes wow he goes these are the people that are in charge of making all of our laws <laughs> they're setting a great example yeah and he's just the idea of screaming you know getting up and yelling at someone all the speaking and screaming he goes he goes yeah he goes in class and school and stuff i was told i couldn't do that and yeah even when other kids were up giving their speeches during class we weren't supposed to interrupt them we were supposed to be nice respectful listeners yeah and then he goes right. yeah what happens here he goes what happened to the nice respectful listeners what happened to all the yeah, that, yeah. i think that's a thing of the past but oh, i would, it is. I I would say this yeah um if we're going to encourage and permit the hoot and hollering in favor 
yeah, yeah. I feel a little uncomfortable saying you can't do something the opposite. Now, screaming liar is a it's a little bit too far for me, even if you think the guy's a lot. That's a little bit too far for me. But you had said something before the show that yeah. I, I think is awesome, which yeah. is, hey, if we want to go the direction of parliament and really yeah. what that's a reference to, if you don't know this every Wednesday, uh, they have something called PMQs, prime minister questions in England. And if you haven't had a chance to watch it yet, it's usually on BBC. It's great. Uh, and it's awesome because yeah. the the, uh, the the prime minister stands up there at the box is what they call it. And the other side and his own side get to pillory yes. him or her with questions. And the questions are so loaded. It is oh, amazing. they're so loading. They're yeah. so loaded. Now, it's I so presume funny. based on what I've seen that they know the subject matter that's coming and, and all that stuff. But there is screaming and hollering. And there's a dude who used to be in a wig up until the, this yeah. current speaker yeah. who would have to stand up and say, oh, da, yeah. oh, da, please oh, da, oh, da. control yeah. yourselves, you know, and then they'd go back to screaming at each other. Other. but it's something that i would love to see presidents sign up for or even governors and that is i'm coming down to the well and let's do 30 minutes a week of you just asking me stuff and putting me on the spot i love that and i'm frankly don't know how many presidents could do it well no but, uh, but it would be great to see see them exposed that way i would love to see them exposed and yeah we've got to decide i understand the cheering i understand the cheering and i can even get behind some of the booing but the standing up and the yelling and the screaming is is like, how old are you? And the other part is this. And the reason I have that is I understand that you may think that he's a liar. You may think you need to yell these things. Fine. But don't then tell our children at these school events or any event that they need to be quiet and be respectful. Don't do it. Stop. Yeah. You have ceded the moral high ground on that issue. If you are going to behave this way during the state of the union let's understand we are is, not that, okay, at a pep that, rally that that's a good one too and that that's is the what, issue what do you tell the kids it, first off if your kids are watching this they're likely shut-ins yeah <laughs> uh they're currently in a leg cast yeah, they course. can't get away or they're grounded they're grounded <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, you I cannot watch the TikTok. If I suggested yes. to my kids, hey, let's watch the State of the Union, I'd have to beg them slash pay <laughs> them to get them to just sit exactly. there on the couch. And then yeah. once it got five minutes in, I would see them look at me, get up and leave. You yeah, know what I mean? Exactly. Like, I got homework, Dad. I got. Yeah. I mean, it would be the it's, only thing that could drive him to do it. And it's the only time they're excited to go do homework. Yeah, like, oh, this, oh Dad, I got this paper. I this go is unbearable. Right yeah. I can't do it. <laughs> Um, but you're right in terms of the example, like, I don't know what we're teaching them to do. And I imagine some will be out there and say, we're teaching them to stand up for truth. And I'm like, yeah, there's probably a better time to do that. Now I don't want decorum to overtake the substance. That's the thing but, is that if, if the truth is pretty much okay, you don't have to yell it at someone during a speech. I mean, if, if truth isn't substantive enough uh, to not be shouted at somebody during the fact they're giving a speech, then. I don't know. Maybe your truth isn't that strong. If that is the only time in which you have to express and that's how you have to express that truth. Again, maybe your internal filters need some work. Maybe you don't understand how and where that type of thing, you know, should be uh, should be expressed. I mean, it's if we're going to you know let people yell and scream and, yeah, and do the and things during the, yeah, yeah. during the state of the union. Then um, why why can't we in you the future what? have someone run up during the you know during the uh, response the rebuttal yeah you know why why can't we have Cory Booker well, last night come I'll in like, like I... push you know push Sarah out of the chair and go no no she's yeah. lying to you and he yeah, does like a touchdown dance okay. and I'm owning the you know the rebuttal yeah, person gets why? hosed because they don't get the audience feedback right like they don't yeah. get the people cheering I think for it's them better. and yeah. when I'm asked to do the rebuttal someday and it's a little dream uh, I would like to have a crowd of people who will just cheer me on when they get the little flashing I, applause sign. I think you, you should just ahead. go with the old uh, 80s sitcom trick and do the uh, you know, laugh, laugh track? track and the applause track. <laughs> you know <laughs> That's what? what you should do. <laughs> that is genius. <laughs> a a little do. homage to the past. Be great. And frankly, uh, yeah. you know what? That's just safer, I think, to do oh, it that it way. Yeah. Now, you watched, and by the way, someone has texted in here foolishly, thank you, Billy, an adult in the room, all caps. <laughs> How refreshing. <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to question... The, the textures i can't be the adult in the room i'm never the adult in the room I, i'm i'm normally referred to as the bad example in the room i'm pointed out as don't do yeah, what he's listen, doing it, it's the same thing yeah. that makes me feel uncomfortable when i refer to someone and i have to lower my tone like that's yeah. so immature exactly. and i'm like i am the immature guy yeah, i am if i'm saying you're immature yeah. there's something you're there's talking something really like wrong. yeah exactly there's something going on <laughs> yeah there's something big here. um 
the Sarah Huckabee Sanders thing. Any feedback on that? That was it was hard for me because I I, I liked the words. I huge applause to her speechwriter. Uh, the way that yeah, they the crafted was good. Oh, the crafting good. of the message was fantastic. The other thing I appreciate was the framing of the shot, um, how they blurred out the background and how they had her sitting there. Very, very effective. Uh, the blurring in the background, it's a, it's a Hollywood trick. It's based on depth perception, but also some lights in the background. Uh, and it's, it forces the camera so it can't focus in the background. So it forces your eye to concentrate on the only thing in the shot that is in focus, and that's Sarah. So very, very cleverly done. Uh, because I will admit yeah. that when I have the interviews and the people have the bookshelves and stuff behind them, I get about three minutes in, and then I'm like, what are you reading? And I start yeah. reading the I start reading the titles. I start looking at the family pictures oh, yeah. you have on the wall. Yeah. So I get that easily distracted with what you're doing. So the fact they blurred it out, very, very intelligent to continue to make sure that Sarah was that focal yeah, that's point. Good. The problem I've got is, I hate to say it, it's Sarah Huckabee Sanders. And one, I don't believe that she is that good at delivering speeches. I don't think that her presentation is top notch. I think she is maybe a C plus to a B minus at best. And she was on her best last night. But I just don't think that she is that effective of a communicator. The other thing that I have a problem with is her brand. I know that inside the GOP, she is viewed as this bright shining light because she is able to capture the governor's house and in Arkansas. And she is the youngest governor in the nation right now around the age of somewhere. Let's see, like at 40, 41, somewhere in there. Uh, that's a great shining light for Republicans. However, the vast majority of the country, their last experience with her was when she was behind the podium in the White House saying things that weren't always necessarily tethered to reality. So the idea <laughs> that, that is such a description <laughs> for you think they yeah. were lies. Yeah. So yeah. The, the problem is that that's her brand. So there are going to be a lot of people that I think could have been persuaded by the speech that are going to look at her through that filter of, well, last time you got up here and we're doing things and speechifying and telling me stuff. It wasn't always true. And I think that was a very, very big risk for the brand. And I'm not I, sure I would have made the same choice. I like at least uh, I love her backstory. Uh, I like the fact that she was able to weave it in there. I mean, listen, bottom line is she is a cancer surviving 40 year old mother of three young kids who is the youngest governor in America. And that juxtaposition and she hit it hard. That speechwriter did hit it hard. Um, in terms of saying, listen, uh, I'm the youngest governor in America. Joe Biden is the oldest president we've ever had in America. And then the woman part, too, which is, you know, I'm, a, I'm the first woman governor of Arkansas. This is a dude who's heading a party that can't define. I mean, those are some strong punches. Um, but I'll and the substance I really liked. I love the story about uh, going to Iraq and being with the the third calf. That's the brave rifle she yeah, talked how, about. The however, however, I will I will throw rocks at her and eggs of course uh, when she, she will. talks about well, <laughs> when she talks about the idea that when she went with Trump to Afghanistan, it was like being in the military. Shut that up. Was Iraq. That that yeah. was Iraq. Whatever. Whatever. I, it, that, that idea. I just remembered it. when I went there. It was like and I just heard it was like being in the military. No. No, it's not. Yeah, it's not. not. Not even close. It, there's there's, there's a risk for thinking? sure. I, I love the description that? of having to go totally dark. And I presume the pilots were all NVG'd up yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. But um, that was a great story. My only thought, though, was that her deliberate pacing at times made it feel plotting. Oh, I mean, yeah, I thought yeah. the substance was an A. I thought the delivery could have been better. And because the delivery matters, like if you have upbeat, great delivery, on C quality uh, substance, you can raise it, right? But the same is true of the opposite. You got A quality substance and you slow it down. I imagine she gave the speech a couple of times in the mirror or to, or to handlers or something. Um, it just brought it down for me. It just yeah. wasn't. But then I see Dana Perino on Twitter saying, this was the greatest rebuttal speech in the history of rebuttal speeches. And I gotta be honest, I can't disagree because I can't remember a single other <laughs> yeah. rebuttal and I've watched them all. Yeah, like, like they all well. suck. Yeah, the one that got me that I that I say on the other side that everyone was doing backflips over on the Democrats was when Cory Booker did it. And I was like, yeah, I, I thought I thought he was really bad at it. And they were just like, oh, it's amazing. And you're like, no, he wasn't that good at it. And and it is I, that's part of when you're talking about uh, Sarah's delivery. I, I, that's part of the problem with that I have with her is I don't think that her pacing. I don't think that how she presents herself at times and she doesn't understand 
how to use some of the emotion to make the delivery swell and then to give it some light and then to let it, you know, settle in for a little bit, give it some breath and then just kind of punctuate. I I go back to, in all honesty, for me, the two best presidential orders, and I'll pick one on either side in my lifetime were Ronald Reagan and Barack Obama. Not a matter of agreeing either way on side of them. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about delivery, the ability of delivery. They were phenomenal. Yeah. Yes. I actually, I, th- I agree with those, but I'll say this, Barack yeah. Obama on the teleprompter, undeniably effective. Barack Obama off the teleprompter, like if you ever watch any of those interviews with Oprah and stuff, the dude can't get past eight trillion. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh. Reagan was better off the cuff than Obama was, but the two of them with the prepared speeches, undeniably better than Bush, even Clinton with that, I feel your pain. Yeah. And uh, and certainly better than, in, in my opinion, Trump and Biden. But the one thing about Trump is the rough edges and sort of that unpolished aspect of him. And you can tell when he's on the teleprompter versus not. I think that what that's what makes him appealing. It makes him to many seem authentic in a way that yeah. these prepared speeches yeah. don't. And it was weird for me on that side. It made me look at him and again people are gonna hate me for this made me look at him weaker uh the fact that when he would go yeah when he would go off and when he would start adding things because the words and the combinations that he used were not necessarily clever they weren't insightful and sometimes and there were some inside the speech writers and there were certain words he couldn't even pronounce and so for me, it was well, it, man, it, welcome to Biden. Yeah, I know. But I mean, Biden's the same thing. There were some words and, and there Biden last gets, night yeah, where I'm like, Biden I'm sorry? Lost as well. And that's why I have, I have problems with both of them. I don't think Biden's a really good speech you know, delivery at all. And he's awful when he's trying to improv. Listen, the folks, worst thing in the world. Oh, the listen, worst thing in the folks. world. Yeah. I, is, if I was on, if I was the handler for either Trump or Biden, the worst thing in the world is have them go off script. Because you know that whatever's going to come out of their mouth is going to be just a, a, incomprehensible vomit at times. And and that's the problem I had with Trump is when he gets off and he starts wandering off into the side, he gets into certain messages and he has this thing about repeating something, very, a very simple phrase, and then repeating it again. And there are certain qualifiers that he uses all the time that are just like, come on, it's yeah, every, everything to him is either the best or the worst. Crutch. The best or the worst. It's the best or the worst. He, I, I don't. He does uh. say that, but I, I'm going to disagree with you on that in this way. I do think that to the average American ear, they would much rather hear someone who they think is talking to them from their heart than from some prepared comments. And so I think what made him and makes him particularly effective as a retail politician is his willingness to deviate from the script and just start, even, even if you disagree with the substance and he does have those crutches, that's true. I just think that most people are like, I just want somebody to talk to me about what they truly believe, not something someone has spoon fed them or scripted for them. Um, and it's something I got to say, even at his age, man, dude has the ability to recall and build into answers things where I'm like, that dude's wicked sharp. I don't feel the same way about our current president. I'm not sure I'm there and he's got dementia, I, I would, I but I do struggle to say yeah. that that guy does things and says things, even during the speech yesterday, words that just sort of became like, like oh, yeah. and I'm like, what? He, he what? loses. What, yeah. was that? what was that? Yeah. The problem is if, if Biden has to deliver something that's more than four sentences long and it doesn't have notes, he loses the plot of the story. He can't figure out where he's going. He can't. The end of it goes goes all the way off the edge of the, the cliff. I, I would disagree with you on Trump when he comes in and he has this ability to recall stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, no, not at all. He just has this ability to make stuff up. He just pulls stuff out and just makes things up. Uh, he just says, oh, well, a lot of people are saying. No, no, that, a lot of people are saying. By the way, I love just, the a lot of people are saying yeah. because you create a straw man that you don't have to take responsibility for. Yeah. But you I know, love that. But what he's doing is when he says um, a lot of people are saying, what he's doing is he's taking his own feelings and giving them voice through other people. There aren't a lot of people saying it. He's just using that as a rhetorical method in order to say something without taking ownership. Uh, I mean, fifth, fifth graders do that. It's I not love necessarily that, clever, though. I mean, in fact, it's not it's not clever. Be- it doesn't add depth. But and before it doesn't we cut away much. for a break, what, yeah. I, what I like about it, and I use this and teach this in jury selection to trial attorneys, and that is the idea that if you want to bring up something that is uh, arguably controversial, don't do it yourself. Like yeah, if I told else. you or if you were or if you said it's just like, hey, some people say blank and then you get some jurors to react to it. It's such a great tool, man. It's just a great tool to inject something into the conversation without having to own it. 
Now, a lot of times I think when Trump says, you know, some people say I'm the best looking president in the modern era. That's him. I mean, he's the some people that's saying that he's always the some people. He might be always many is. times. He might be always the some is. people. Yeah. You know what I mean? He always is. And it's because of I have spent enough time, you know, coaching and dealing with kids at, you know, at that, at that level. And that's what they do. This this fourth, fifth, sixth graders. That's how they, you know, give voice to their feelings without taking ownership of it. And so I, I understand the rhetorical use of it and understand even why in the courtroom it would be effective but when i hear that yeah. i look at it and go ah oh, you're just being an a an a-hole yeah. you're, you're just trying you're just, just trying to is that trying you to... the guy who has the tuned expert ear for this do you think most americans hear that and think the same thing or are they like no. oh no most americans think that oh he's talking about a large group of people which is why it's effective <laughs> you know that's again that that's why and and, it's, and and it works on either side of the aisle i'm not i'm not just saying that this is just something that republicans do democrats do it as well they, they do that a lot, especially with some of the climate change yeah. and some of their stuff. They do that a whole lot. So, uh, yeah, it's not unique. Let, we've gone a little long, but that's yeah, just have. how we We're do things. Go. I still need to get into the best parts of the six o'clock hour, if not the whole show, which is the Thorpe Report. And you choose the news, which we'll do after this break. For folks looking at the YouTube thing and wondering, why is Big Daddy Woo Woo wearing the, uh, the winter coat there? And it's a light winter coat. Uh, it's because... We're at icebox temperatures here. I had tried to go without the coat, but I got the goose flesh everywhere. And I thought, man, I'm going to warm up here until at least the sun comes out and starts to heat the building. Artif I mean, naturally, instead of this artificial cooling that's going on. So that's what's going on. Uh, hey, listen, we're going to be back. You stick around. It gets good right after this. It's George Brockler on The George Show 710 KNUS.
You can't hear it on the podcast, but if you're listening live or on YouTube, what you know is this is fitting bumper music. A little bit of who here. We won't get fooled again. Oh, right there. George Brock, we're back with you here on the George Show 710 KNUS. We cut away for a break after a long segment, and we have the time to jump right back into the good stuff. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do the Thorpe Report till the next break. We're going to come back and do the fun stuff, and that is the You Choose the News. William, you have the com. Good morning, sir. Well, we were talking about a little bit earlier. A cold front is going to bring snow to the northern mountains today. Uh, it's going to be a little warmer ahead of our next snow, snow, a snow system, easy for me to say, uh, here in the city. Highs are going to be back into the upper 40s and lower 50s in our Denver area. The cold front is going to move through Colorado late tonight and early tomorrow. Colder weather and a little bit of light snow. The storm's not expected to be very strong. Just an inch or two possible for Denver Thursday morning. Three to six inches expected in the mountains. Roads should be slick in the mountains and around the metro area Wednesday night and Thursday morning. So your morning commute tomorrow could be a little more complicated. Thursday is going to be windy and colder. Uh, sn- some snow in the Denver area again, but more snow in the mountains. Highs are going to be in the middle 30s for Denver and eastern plains. And a lot of winds in the mountains. Uh, snow showers again are going to be de rigueur. Uh, Jefferson County Sheriff Sheriff's Office is assisting the Lakeside Police Department following a police shooting last night. No officers Uh-oh. were injured. Thank police, yep, police shot and wounded a shoplifting suspect who was in a field outside a Walmart shopping center near West 44th Avenue in Lakeside, according to the Sheriff's Office. The suspect was transported to the hospital after the shooting. Non-life-threatening injuries, and that's as much as we know is right the, now. Is the lesson to be learned here that uh, if you shoplift in the Lakeside area, <laughs> you will be gunned down? Yeah. Again, I'm somewhat okay with that. That <laughs> might <laughs> not, you know, uh, choices that, have consequences. That not might necessarily reduce that shoplifting that. quite a bit. Yeah, I think it would. Yes. <laughs> Steal a Snickers, lose yeah. your life. That's yeah. harsh. Yeah, that is, is harsh. really harsh. Yeah, I'm not saying it's necessarily the right choice, but I'm saying it did slow things down. Um, a man was tracking his stolen vehicle when he allegedly shot and killed the driver recently. It was an exchange of gunfire Sunday and the driver that was killed was a 12-year-old boy. Mm. Sometime on Sunday, the Denver Police Department received a report of an auto theft around the 8300 block of East Northfield Boulevard. Vehicle owner told authorities he was tracking the vehicle using an app and found it in the area of West 12th West Avenue and North Decatur Street. When the owner approached the car, he was involved in exchange of gunfire. Thing that I want to know is this is the old Star Wars New Hope question. Han Greedo, who shot first? Uh, those inside the vehicle, according to Denver police, say, yeah, they did exchange gunfire. Juvenile male drove the car to the 2900 block of West 10th Avenue, where officers found him suffering from a gunshot wound. That's the 12-year-old boy. He was taken to the hospital and later pronounced dead. Uh, yeah. And, yep. And uh, vehicle owner was contacted the scene by the officers, has not been arrested, and they're going to determine if any if he will face any charges at all. Yeah, that's a yeah. – this is an interesting one. It brings up a couple issues. First off, and as a, a primary matter yeah. here – you know, the death of a 12 year old boy really under almost every circumstance yeah. is a tragedy. Um, I'm not making excuses for yeah. what he may or may not have done in stealing the car and driving and all that. But my God, man, I mean, that's a year now younger than Graham. He was 12 yeah. just months ago. It, it's hard to envision a boy losing his life at that time, whether it was um, legally uh, permitted or not. The other thing is, if we and I had this conversation, by the way, with some people I really respect uh, in the military recently, and some of them were of the mind that I'm OK with using lethal force to protect my property. And I can't get there from here. I mean, it's one thing to break into someone's house. Then I think it's all all, you know, take the gloves off, Katie, bar the door, do whatever you can to that person. I, I don't have any problems with that. But the idea that you run outside, someone steals your car, you chase them down and you do so with a gun, maybe with the intent to get it back, but I, I'm not, I'm not down with life for property. I don't think that's us, but if you go and find your car and in confronting the people that stole it, or at least in possession of it, they pull guns on you, then it's go time because yeah. I, I, I do not, I don't want to suggest that self-defense or defense of others should ever be limited or infringed. I believe in that a hundred percent. So this very interesting case. Again, very interesting case. This, this to me also dovetails a touch with the uh, shoplifting case we were talking about earlier. Again, I shouldn't be in charge of things because I know that I am twisted and I'm not always even close to being right. But uh, there's a part of me that thinks, oh, if you steal something, the guy finds you with it and then he shoots you. 
maybe we don't steal things as much as possible, or at least cuts down on the people that are doing the stealing things. Again, not saying that is morally or even ethically right. I'm just saying it, it may curb the crime population at the point. But I do agree with you that if you are going after your stolen property and the people that have your property pull guns on you. Oh, man. Yeah, yep. that's it. Then, get it. OK, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm all in. Here's my worry. And I wrote yeah, yeah. a column on this for the Gazette a little while ago, and that is the idea that because of the perceived ineffectiveness of law enforcement. And a lot of that has yep. to do with staffing and, and some of the law changes we've had to put them on their heels. More and more people are going to resort to self-help and vigilanteism. And I think we're going to see more and more stories that sadly turn out like this. I think we are, too. And we also have to realize that, again, um, there are things out there in their marketing and their messaging that is out there inside of the media that the police aren't going to arrive in time. So you better be able to take care of yourself and protect yourself. And those messages dovetail nicely with, well, if you've taken my stuff, I've got to protect yep. my stuff. Yeah, that's right. So that's a problem, too. But we'll see what happens. A 70 year old man has died after a January 28th hit and run crash in Aurora. Police are asking for your help finding the suspected driver's vehicle. Coward. Yep. Happened about uh, 12 47 p.m. Officers with Aurora Police Department responded to a hit and run. It was near Chambers Road and East Tennessee Avenue. When they arrived, they found a Toyota Camry with two injured people inside. Both individuals transported to the hospital. The 70 year old man has passed away. Uh, police in Castle Rock are asking for your help to identify the driver of a pickup truck that was involved in a hit and run crash on monday afternoon coward yeah police said the pickup truck was a black dodge ram has multiple distinct characteristics including a lift kit running boards orange and black toolbox in the bed a custom grill with a t-rex sticker and aftermarket wheels and tires and i so, want to be clear yeah you hit and run a person you must go to prison yeah. you hit and run a car where there's injuries you must be incarcerated yes we don't have that law in Colorado, and we continue no. to see garbage like this. Yeah, because it, there's no punishment for what it is. And again, uh, I have four kids. There has to be some punishment or the behavior is going to continue. Uh, the new report from the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences shows a 72% decline in western bumblebees here in Colorado's southern Rocky what? Mountains since 1998. The report found that climate change, drought, and increased use of some pesticides that put bumblebees and other pollinators at risk. Uh, it comes as Colorado lawmakers are considering a bill to reduce some of the offending pesticides. A similar bill was, was uh, introduced last year and failed. I am concerned about the bees. The reason I throw that in there, because uh, the bees are how we get the food. We don't have the pollinators. We do not get the food. That's kind of a little yeah, that's thing important. That, that we're kind of forgetting. So that's it. That's all I've got for the Thorpe Report. So we probably should. Uh, you know, Buddy, that's good stuff. Look, perfect stuff. time for us to cut yeah. away and come back with the even better stuff uh obviously the uh the thorpe report very very important makes us a lot smarter but it makes us happier to hear you choose the news we'll get to that right after this, this is george brockwood on the george show you're listening to 710 knus
I think to do his research, Billy talks to angels, but not the good ones. It's now time for you choose the news, <laughs> Billy. Yes, good morning, sir. It is that time where, oh, we play everybody's favorite radio news game show, You Choose the News, where we have scoured the interwebs for ridiculous stories and given them, well, frankly, really dumb headlines. And then we play this fake radio news game. Why? Well, because... For some reason, they continue to pay us for it. It's fantastic today because Barnes & Noble is back yet again with a new self-help book. We will talk to you about how you can help yourself on a discount later today. Uh, but first, we must play the game. All righty, sir. Here are your headline choices. Headline number one, taking out the competition. Headline number two, it's to keep out the pores. Headline number three, hidden meaning in childhood art. And headline four, free parking. All righty, sir. Your choices again this morning are taking out the competition. It's to keep out the pores, hidden meaning in childhood art, and free parking. Listen, because I think it may have something to do with the skincare tip, I'm going to go with keeping out the pores. Ah, keeping out the pores. Here we are going to go across the pond to merry old England and talk about the peers entrance to Westminster. Specifically, that is the House of Lords in England. Yes, the Tory government is coming under fire for a new budget proposal. Um, the bill is for... What originally was going to cost them two million pounds and is now risen to seven million pounds. What, pray tell, could the House of Lords, yeah. controlled again by the Tories, which is the conservative side of the government, be spending seven million pounds on a uh, fancy new door? Wait, yes. a door? Yes, a Is door. Is it to the country? No, a door just to the House of Lords. Seven uh, million? Yes, they are spending seven million pounds on a new fancy door. Does it come for with the House of Lords? No, but it is to keep out the pores. It comes with this, you know, like those big thing in the back <laughs> that you can put down there in case they start charging in. And so that's the idea that people on both sides of the aisle are like, hey, hey, this is a problem. Michael Forsyth, the chairman of a conservative peer group, uh, raised concerns. He said, um, seven million. This is not OK. I guess the, the costs have uh, more than tripled in less than a year. Maybe we don't get the door. <laughs> so he's got a point. So I, I just I, think that's kind of funny. I, yeah. What makes it seven million pounds? And it makes me wonder. <laughs> they too, need a, a big se- fancy door. <laughs> we should have talked about this in the prior segment. But yeah. what if we had a state of the union bouncer? You know what I mean? Like Ooh. Biden just points at some people who are I screaming like and, and they walk. Over there. It's, just, it's like a Terry Crews walks oh, over there and I just like picks that. up Marjorie Taylor Green, <laughs> takes her out of it. You know what puts I mean? Her, like puts her over his shoulder. Yeah, and you got to go. Out of there. You got to go. Yeah, <laughs> That's funny. fantastic. All right. Second choice this morning, sir. Taking out the competition. Hidden meaning in childhood art or free parking? Free parking, please. Free parking. This is in Huntsville, Alabama. Recently, police were called um, to the, where is it, the 200 block of Church Street, specifically to Big Spring Park. See, there was a disturbance at Big Spring Park, specifically at the pond. Why? Well, unfortunately, a 90-year-old, 91-year-old man decided to turn Big Spring Park's pond into a parking lot. Yes. What? Um, he, he, he was following his GPS system and was trying to go somewhere. And they told him to turn and park into the parking lot. And it told him to turn into the big spring pond. And he did. Mm, that because, you know, the GPS is always right. <laughs> <laughs> I just the thing that I keep looking at is when he turns and he sees the big body of water. Did he think I'm the first one here? I mean, what, yeah. What, what exactly went through What's his mind? What's going on say, here? Yeah, how come there are no lines? Google's <laughs> never wrong. Yeah, Never. AI yeah. people. Exactly. So I just the idea that there's a nice little man that is just listening to the little voice in the car that says turn, turn right. Left. And you're like, yeah. OK, <laughs> here we go. Who yeah. hasn't been okay. there? The other part is this. OK, now, just on a side note. I get really mad at the GPS systems because it's making me do math. It's going, turn right in 500 feet. Do you think I know how far no, 500 feet don't. is? You don't. You, <laughs> you have to I have know? the picture. I don't know. And sometimes when I there's a know. delay, if you're in a troubled yes. area, it'll say things and the map will show like, turn right. Yeah. And you're like, I'm past it. Yeah, I mean, past, I'm like yes. in the intersection, dude. Yes, I can't do this now. Uh, yeah. But again, thank you for making me do math and go in 5,000 feet. You're going to have to. No, I don't know. Stop that. Uh, okay. Uh, final choice this morning. Taking out the competition or hidden meaning in childhood art? Taking out the competition. I'm going to save art for Friday. I'm ah, just saying. Taking out the competition. Here, we are going to travel back to, remember, Groundhog Day. Yes, and going up to lovely Quebec, Canada, where we are going to meet Fred Lermarmot. 
Yes, he is uh, the Quebec's version of Puxitani Phil. He's not actually a no, groundhog really. because, you know, they do things different in Canada. He's a marmot. Um, but unfortunately, a crowd of spectators. Yes, he's a marmot. Yeah, he's uh, Fred Le Marmot. Um, he, so he's a marmot. And a crowd of spectators gathered for the event in Dal Esprit, Quebec. And it was the organizer of the event said, Today, it is going to be different than all the other Groundhog Day events we've ever had in this lovely town in Quebec. Why? Well, because, well, unfortunately, this morning we found out that Fred is dead. What? Yeah, Fred what the happened? Marmot. Fred the Marmot passed away. They didn't know that until the morning of the Groundhog Day thingy, and they started checking his vital signs, and sure enough, dead Marmot. However, they, so they had a nice Did celebration. Did see his shadow? That's the thing, is I think you can still do it. You can still pick up the dead rat and yeah, look, yeah. And, and then if it casts a shadow, haha, winner. So, again, I, I think that they missed an opportunity here for calling it off and, and doing some sort of other celebration. They could have still predicted. I, I just think that I don't think the life of the, the, the big giant rat is necessarily an important piece of the forecasting of the weather. So, oh, well. But over in Nova Scotia, their ground hall, hog, um, Shubin Kata Sam saw her shadow. So they're going to get six more weeks of winter there. I don't know. What? And then I have no idea. It's, 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 I don't know. It's S H U B E N. A C A D I E. I don't know. Listen, I want to see. I want to see these weather predicting creatures in some sort of a cage say, match. It's, yeah, it's just you know what I mean. Like, but the other Phil yes. weighing <laughs> in at seven pounds thirteen ounces. <laughs> yeah, so we've got. So I guess over in Nova Scotia, they're going to have six more weeks of winter, and in uh, Quebec, Canada, um, they're just going to have zombies because they <laughs> head into the <laughs> a dead groundhog. I yes. see dead marmots. <laughs> and that is it. That is the end of you choose the news. As always, George is our winner, and I am your perennial loser. But today and today only, you can get a discount on a brand new book from Barnes and Noble. Yes, they are starting a new self help series today. You can get twenty percent off if you mention the show on their new title, Fi "Fighting Self Doubt." Or should you? All sorts of questions you can ask yourself and answer yourself if you are smart enough. All righty. Back to you, sir. Back by popular demand in the 7 o'clock hour, it's our own odd couple, Arash and Ted, with their differing views on the State of the Union. You stick around. It's George Broccoli on The George Show. You're listening to 710 KNUS.
You're missing Rush's Tom Sawyer here if you're listening on the podcast. Uh, but you're not missing it if you're listening live. And if you're listening live, you get to hear something awesome coming up. It is our version of, and do you have the music cued, Billy? Here we go. Billy's firing it now. There it is. <laughs> oh. Love it. We are pleased as punch to once again be joined by, and honestly, they should have their own show, kind of like Siskel and Ebert. It's Arash Masale and Ted Trimpa Masale. Thank you for joining us both, Arash and Ted. Oh, hey, George. Good to be here. I have just hey, hyphenated your last name, Ted. I hope that's exactly what you intended. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Everybody's going to think I'm a right winger now, but that's okay. <laughs> Some in your party probably believe that. Now, listen, for folks that don't know you, give us the 15 to 30 second description, Arash. Alrighty. So I am, uh, let's see, uh, senior producer of the Gutfeld Show on Fox News. Boom. Uh, right wing, conservative. That's me. And uh, your husband, Ted, go. Uh, I'm the rational Democrat, the rational one in the relationship. <laughs> the other thing that people need to remember about you, Ted, is that you're the person lurking around the pages of the blueprint that kind of turned Colorado from the state I grew up in until the state it is now. So congratulations on that effort. Uh, you continue to make efforts on the policy side, too. But because you both bring these different political perspectives, one, this is a testament to the fact that love can triumph just about anything uh but two it gives us an opportunity to discuss the state of the union first arash did you watch it you have some pretty big duties with the most popular late night show out there uh, were you able to take in the state of the union last night uh yes i did um i watched it not only for my show but in preparation for your show now um so I definitely have some thoughts. Yes, probably and, they're going to, well, for sure, they're going to differ from Ted's. <laughs> well, well, Ted, did you watch it as well? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. And would you watch it? I, I presume you guys would watch it anyway. Now, for me, if it wasn't for the radio show, I'd have probably watched it like I did in the rearview mirror, but I'm always interested. Would you guys have watched it anyway? No, I would have for sure. Arash? Uh, I mean, I, I would have too, but probably not paying as much attention as I did. I mean, I tried to pay as much attention as I could, but it's kind of hard with Biden. Yeah, well, and I said this, too, in the earlier segment. I probably made the mistake of trying to start watching it on YouTube when I was in bed just so that no one else had to be subjected to it. And honestly, I got about 20 minutes in and then it was Z time and I was out. And then I watched the rest of it this morning in the early morning hours. Ted, give me your overall takeaway from the the state of the union and you have great perspective because you've seen all these other ones does it rank high middle low and tell me what your overall sense of it is i mean i i, I thought it was high i mean he was he was on fire that was biden on fire you know let's finish the job i think he outlined you know what the priorities need to be and he particularly went through you know, successes bipartisan successes um so i mean i would give it an a minus I mean, it was vintage Biden, vintage Biden. It's some of the ad libs that were hilarious. I mean, he got the Republicans to agree to not cut Social Security and Medicare on site. Well, t frankly, that was an interesting portion of the speech. Do you think that was planned or that just happened? I think it just happened. I mean, I, it's, you know, he got such a reaction from the Marjorie Taylor Greens, which, by the way, you know, where did she get etiquette from? Um, you know, I don't know when she went to you know, some uh, like cereal box class or, you know, I, you got me. But I have to tell you, it was an embarrassing performance. Um, uh, but he handled it well. He handled it well. Uh, Arash, I presume you echo the sentiments of Ted. Exactly. One hundred percent. I agree with everything <laughs> he just said. Um, well, I mean, I mean, needless to say, I think we were watching two different uh, state of the unions. Um, I mean, I didn't learn anything really from that State of the Union other than there's such a thing as resort junk fees and that there's a fee that people pay more to fly on airplanes with families. I mean, I, like these are the little issues that really you're going to spend time more time on resort junk fees than the Chinese spy balloon that he kind of just brushed over. Um, Do you remember so what I he said know. about the spy and balloon last night? I don't exactly remember the exact words. I don't think he said balloon. No, he, was, he never just, referenced he, it. <laughs> he no, never, never referenced did. it. Yeah, he never did. He kind of alluded to it. 
Uh, you know, the whole speech I was reading this morning was 7,000 words. I think 182 of which were in reference to the balloon, and that only happened like one hour into the speech. There was more time focused on those fees that I had never heard of and lead pipes than, you know, the issues that actually matter, what people are actually talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Ted said that he, Ted said it was vintage Biden. Well, I don't, I mean, if, if Biden himself is vintage, I mean, so I wouldn't expect anything less. That's a great line. Can I get you each to react to this? And I'll start with the rush. This is one particularly interesting moment. Have you noticed Big Oil just reported his profits, record profits? Last year, they made $200 billion in the midst of a global energy crisis. I think it's outrageous. Why? They invested too little of that profit to increase domestic production. And when I talk to a couple of them, they say, we're afraid you're going to shut down all the oil wells and all the uh, oil refineries anyway, so why should we invest in them? I said, we're going to need oil for at least another decade. (laughs) And that's going to exceed. (laughs) And beyond that, we're going to need it. (laughs) Arash, thoughts? I mean, only a decade? I mean, I would think we're going to need oil for much longer than that. And I mean, he was just passing the buck on all those gas, on all on the high price of gas. I mean, that was crazy. No, I mean, I couldn't hear the heckling. Like there, I could hear it vaguely. I don't know. Could you hear it better on your end, George? No, but there was some stuff going on. Really, what you had to do though is you had to watch the camera because you could hear some things if you just listened to it. And that's what I tried to do. But then I went back as I'm watching it, and then you can see them focus on, you know, Congresswoman Boebert or Marjorie Taylor Greene or whatever, and, and they're focusing on the people who are gesturing or saying things. Ted, when you hear that, is that the vintage Biden stuff? Was it a misspeak? Was it what was that? And and tell me your reaction to what he said. Well, I think the decade piece was um, a misspeak, and it was just an ad lib that really wasn't accurate. And and this is one where I would agree with conservatives. When you think about the oil and gas industry, is one we're always going to need. And it's going to be a question of the level and for what. But there are a lot of things that oil and gas is used for outside of just powering cars. Um, and two, this idea that oh, they should have been investing. Well, you know, it's been restricted. I mean, they're new regulations that have come, EPA has done a lot. And, you know, the other thing is, is that, you know, when you invest within oil and gas, it's not like you get that return the next day. I mean, it takes a while for that to happen. So, I mean, it, it's inaccurate to say, and I think it was a cheap shot from, from my viewpoint. You know, Ted, that's incredibly reasonable. I think the other thing is he was candid and it made sense to me when he said, listen, I talked to these big oil execs and I'm like, why aren't you guys building more refineries? And they're like, and I think this is candid. We're not going to sink cabillions of dollars into building something that you're going to make obsolete or regulate out of existence in a short period of time. That's good business sense. That's not anti-American or profiteering. That is just straight up reality, right? Like, why would you invest in something if you're going to make it go away? And then he echoes, hey, we're going to need you for at least another (laughs) decade. I thought that was a telling moment. This is the other one, though, that we talked about. And Ted, I'll start with you to get this reaction. All of you at home should know what those plans are. Instead of making the wealthy pay their fair share, some Republicans, some Republicans want Medicare and Social Security to sunset. I'm not saying it's a majority. Let me give you anybody who doubts it. Contact my office. I'll give you a copy. I'll give you a copy of the proposal. Uh, Ted, what do you hear there? Well, it's the truth. I mean, Rick Scott put out a paper and, you know, he was chair of the NRSC, you know, electing Republican senators, and he proposed sunsetting uh, Social Security and Medicare. So, I mean, it's just the truth. Now, did every Republican do it? No. Did Mitch McConnell, you know, say this is a good idea? No. But it's the truth. And if you have somebody within a party that's proposing something that's preposterous, then you need to call it out. And that's what the president was doing. Arash, what did you hear there? That's one person said, and then he tries to walk it back. Well, I'm not saying it's a majority. It's literally not even a minority said. So, I mean, the way he's framed it, it made it seem like all Republicans want to kill seniors. What did so. you think, Arash, of his? And again, I couldn't tell if it was scripted. Ted said he thought it was just off the cuff, but his sort of judo move there to then say, wow, it sounds like we have consensus on protecting Medicare and Social Security. What do you think of that? I mean, I, I think it was, it was unscripted. 
It was unscripted, definitely. Uh, I mean, he went off script, probably. Uh, I would have to read the transcript, but yeah, I don't think that was planned. I mean, that's, I would, I'll give him that. That's pretty smart to do it right there on the spot. Um, so, I mean, I hope we also talk about the fentanyl crisis, too, because yep. that was another issue. Yeah, we will. T Ted, I, I thought it was clever. And here's the double whammy, I think, for Republicans. One, I thought it was clever to use that move. But two, his ability to do that kind of rebuts this idea. And I think a lot of people have wondered this if the dude is all there all the time. I mean, to be able to pull that off like that on your feet, pretty good. That's great. And, uh, you know, so what he's 80. Um, you know, it seemed like to me all his faculties were there. He gave off, you know, a great speech, had a lot of energy. Um, and it's not like when he walked off the podium, he passed out. Um, you know, he took, what, 20 minutes or something to get out of the chamber, talking, okay. taking selfies. You know, so I, I think this whole let's get worried about the fact that he's 80 is overblown. Although Ted, he's Teddy. So we, we're supposed to congratulate him for not for not falling over <laughs> the bar is for low. simply walking, walking 50 feet. Ted, that's crazy. He's the <laughs> oldest president ever in the pub. He's he makes he makes he makes Ronald Reagan look like an infant. I also Ted. think we're entitled to know when they woke him up from the nap. You know what I mean? Like if this guy was able to <laughs> pardon me, lay on the couch for several hours beforehand. That's just not something that you would expect. It, but again, let's get to the fentanyl crisis stuff. Uh, Arash, what did you want to hear and what did you hear? Well, I didn't really hear much. Uh, I mean, he didn't really address how or why we have this fentanyl crisis here in America. He didn't talk about the border. He didn't talk about how it's pouring through from the cartels from China. He didn't talk about that. He just said it's like happening. So, I mean, he didn't really address why it's happening. And, and you, you probably to. heard this, and Ted, you probably heard this too. When he began to address fentanyl, and he did, he did raise it, there were people that heckled out the border, the border, the border words to that effect. Ted, what were your thoughts on it? Did, should he have said more, done more, or was it was what he did enough? No, you, you only have so much you can do within one speech. And he Ted. did mention the border. He did mention the border. He said, you know, pass this immigration policy that I've had before you. And if you won't pass that, at least give it money and resources for them to do what they have to do today based on what the law is today. And, you know, that's that's saying something. That is an immigration policy. That was coming from the president. That was coming from the president of the State of the Union. So to say that he's not making a priority because he didn't spend 10 minutes on it, um, I just think is unfair. Ted, you say he only has so much to t time to speak in a speech. There is no time limit on the speech. You know, it went 72 yeah. minutes. It could have gone 75. It could have gone 80. There's been longer speeches in the past. So, I mean, that's kind of that's kind of rich to say that there is he could have he didn't you only have so much time in a speech. I mean, there, for a crisis that's killing hundreds of thousands of people, I think more than I think 10 minutes is is not that much to ask. What did you think about the border in general? He did sort of talk about it he didn't talk about the fact that we have jillions pouring over the border apparently just at will um, but he did reference border patrol increasing number of borders T ted what do you think about that and is that an issue that is going to play in 2024 and for who um, it's definitely an issue that's going to play i mean i i will admit that democrats have been running from immigration uh, for quite some time and i think there was an indication of how they were going to handle immigration when they said the vice president was going to take care of it, and then she hasn't been the most effective vice president. Has she been to the border I, I yet? I will give you that. And I mean, I know well, it's not Europe, but has she been to the border? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one could argue in her mind it's close, but, um, <laughs> you know, but there really is, there really is a proposed border policy. I mean, there's proposed policy around the DACA students. And, you know, I, Republicans, and Republicans like Arash, God bless them, I love them, are going to milk this for all it's worth. Um, because, you know, you can't honestly say that there isn't a border crisis, and that I have to agree to that. Um, I mean, it's like saying, you know, there's a sky blue. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you also can't say that Democrats haven't been proposing uh, immigration policies. I mean, Republicans are just, you know, taking this and trying to pay politics with it. Arash? It's politics. You guys do it all the time with your issues, so... 
I mean, it was nice to hear about the border patrol, but I mean, we'll actually see if that comes to fruition. Look, I mean, the dreamers, a lot of words. dreamers things legit, but that is not what's happening at the border. This is not a quote unquote dreamers <laughs> issue. There's something else going on. Um, can we shift gears to Sarah Huckabee Sanders on the rebuttal or the response, if you will? And I, I say that only because I watched it. But the feedback has been so strong. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on it. Arash, what did you think? Uh, I mean, I thought she nailed it on the head where it's no longer about right versus left. It's about, you know, what was it? The, what was the line? Crazy versus normal? Or uh, I forgot what, what the, her exact words were, but that like nails it on the head. You know, Biden is kind of abdicating to the woke mob who can't define what a woman is. I mean, that spells it out perfectly. Um, I mean, should she have focused so much on the culture wars? I mean, I don't know, uh, but I think it's a def definitely a smart move and one that I totally, you know, agree with. I mean, these are the culture war kind of things that people talk about. Um, I know Ted and I always argue about this kind of stuff. Um, so, I mean, I gave her, I thought she did well. I thought it was great. Ted, what do you think? Um, I think it was lackluster. Um, I think that, you know, it came across as being somewhat bitter. Um, I think using the example to make it sound like, you know, it's one in a kind thing and it never happens. Uh, you know, the trip that the president made, you know, into Iraq. I mean, every president, you know, that I know and remember, and remember uh, did something like that. So, you know, I think that, that was a little much. That was a little rich. Um, and it's crazy and normal. You know, there are crazy Republicans. If you don't think that there aren't crazy people, listen to Marjorie Taylor Greene for three minutes. Listen to some of the things that Bobert says. Listen to some of the things that come out of the Freedom Caucus. I mean, it, some of this is just amazing. And, you know, I think if you take a look at what Biden's done and the bipartisan legislation in the past, you know, the infrastructure bill is the largest investment in infrastructure since Eisenhower. Um, and that happened because of him. And you, you have to give credit where credit is due. And I think Republicans are just blind to it. Um, here's what I want to do with the couple minutes that we have left. I want to offer each of you the opportunity to ask the other a question. I love the <laughs> give and, and take, but I want you to limit it to only the state of the union, the response or some other incredibly personal issue. Go ahead, Ted. Oh, wow. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> so, so Ross, do you really think that um, Social Security and Medicare should be cut? Should the retirement age be, be raised? Uh, should the retirement, Ted, this is not really a topic that I'm well versed in, but should it be raised? I mean, how long, how many years are we talking? Like two. I mean, that's fine. Okay. Raise it. I don't think it should be cut. Of course not. I want to see my social security checks when the time comes. So no. So you would say, yeah. so, but you would say, yes, raise it two years. That's not a problem or you don't want to see it raised. Um, I could, I mean, I don't find that a problem. Ted, okay, is, two years. is that a problem, Ted? Well, yeah. I mean, if, if they're going to do it, this needs to be done over time. You know, you have seniors that have planned this, um, you know, in terms of when the retirement's going to be is, and do it at 65, what they do at 65, they can wait at 67, they can get more. Um, I mean, I just think that you just shouldn't do it uh, overnight. Hmm. You like a day, yeah, a year you know, or something? about it. And I have to point out, it's it's a little rich that all of a sudden Republicans are saying, oh, we're not going to touch Social Security and Medicare. We're not going to touch Social Security and Medicare. Um, when that has been a mantra for them for a long time. And G.W. Bush, you know, opened up a lot of that and wanted to go reform Social Security. He got that rammed up his backside. Well, to be to be fair, what Biden said that got all the reaction was there are those here in the chamber, whatever, Republicans that want to end it or phase it out. That's a far cry from people who are like, we need to reform it or we need to consider raising the retirement age so we can protect the, the amount of money that's supposed to be there for all of these retirees and stuff like that. Th th those are two different things. I mean, he did a little switcheroo there by saying, oh, oh you were upset at the idea of phasing it out. That must mean you want to protect it and uh, and not make any changes. And it's like, I think there's a, a Grand Canyon's worth of middle ground in there. But again, to Biden's credit. That was some fancy, clever uh, judo that was in there. Now, Arash, your turn. Oh, this is great. Uh, <laughs> Ted, Ted, can you tell me what a woman is? <laughs> J Justice Trimpa? 
Well, first of all, biologically, we know what a woman is. I mean, it's pretty obvious, you know, in terms of the biology, but it does exist in nature and it has, you know, for all the time that, you know, I've been around, I think a lot of people have been around, that there's some people that they just always felt like they, they're sex, they're, you know, whether the male or female doesn't match the biology. And I don't see why that is a problem. I don't see why Republicans get, you know, they're so wrapped around an axle. Um, about something that, you know, overwhelmingly doesn't affect them. And it affects a lot of people in this country. So, a lo- yeah, I, a lot of I, people can't, that- I can't define a woman. You can define a woman? Yeah, I just you, defined you didn't a really, you didn't. You didn't really know you didn't. You just said, you just said we all know what it is. Well, you just, oh, come on. I'm not going to say the word, you know, the biology of a woman, everybody knows. Okay, I'm right. all right. But the reason Republicans, quote unquote, make it a big deal is because it's rammed down everyone's throats in school, everywhere you look, school, TV, movies, commercials. You can't even turn on a commercial these days without seeing, oh, I don't know, like, I don't know. That's why it's that's why it's such a big deal, because the left puts it everywhere. Media. Oh, Oh, come on. What what are we going to do? Bring back Eisenhower as the president. We're going to have to contribute that it's 1950. (laughs) <laughs> you know, gosh, the, the fact the fact that we have the fact that something exists that all of a sudden is now appearing, you know, in social media, the culture, TV, um, well, that's that's just logical. That's the thing that could happen. Alyssa, now, again, uh, I don't get I don't get why you guys get so wrapped around an axle. Well, I, really in sure. in part, Ted, I'd say from my point of view, in part because it's such an obvious answer and it's been such an obvious thing forever and it's it's never been like a debatable proposition until recently and you know when you have uh justice katanji brown jackson struggling saying well i don't know it makes normal everyday americans i think even even from both sides go wait what and and i know we're trying to make this distinction between gender and sex i just don't think most americans make that distinction i think they say you're a man you're a woman, you've got boy parts, you've got girl parts, and and I get all the other stuff, and we can tolerate some things, but please don't try to tell me this is a woman when I know it's not. And with that, I've I've, I've killed the conversation. Here's what I want to do. I want (laughs) to beg the two of you to launch a podcast. I have no doubt in the world it would take off. Now, the the word smartless has already been taken, so you'll have to come up with something else. I just want to be a referee for this great conversation. We've had great texts coming in here, people that agree or disagree with each. I love this conversation, and I want to thank you both for taking time out of your morning to come on and have this conversation about the State of the Union and the response. Oh, happy to do it. Happy to do it. And, and Ross, we have to figure out, you know, matching food tonight. We have this new tradition of you know, if I go to a restaurant and have fish and chips, then he goes to a because he's in New York. He goes to a restaurant and has fish and chips, and then we compare. Oh, really? Uh, or whatever the, the way or whatever of, the dish is, whatever the dish. We'll have the same dish and then compare. Isn't this part of the pod? I'm telling you guys, you make this podcast thing, you get to retire from the other things that you're doing. You end up, Arash, becoming a guest on Gutfeld. That's what ends up happening. You move, <laughs> move from behind the scenes to on the scene right there. That's what's going to happen. You yeah, and Kat. Well, you just have to be willing to go to bed mad every now and then. And if you're willing to go to bed mad, then a relationship like this can really work. It's baked into marriage, as you know. That is just one of those <laughs> things. It happens some of the days. Other days, there's just pure joy. But that that's just the way it works. Arash, Ted, thank you guys so much. I want to have you on again because I think the feedback is wonderful. Oh, great. Thank you, George. It was, oh, uh, happy it was great. Cool. Always. And hi to Greg. Uh, We'll talk to you guys later. Hey, listen, we're going to cut away for a break. And when we come back, uh, we're going to be joined by you. That's because you're picking up the phone right now. Just do it. Dial 303-696-1971. Dial those numbers and have the conversation. What did you hear? You agree with, I mean, listen, honestly, Ted didn't say all the stuff that you would imagine a Democrat would say. Uh, And I think that's what makes him incredibly credible is the idea that he's willing to give on some of the things that others are just too, too opposed to, too ideological to give in on. Do you agree with Ted? Did you agree with Rosh? What about that state of the union? We have more sound from that too. You stick around. It's George Brocklin on the George show 710 KNUS.
I hope we get there because I want to test out the on the mend vocal cords. And we're not going to get there? Billy's shaking his head. Come on, Stephen Perry, jump in here. Well, folks, you can drown me out if you want to with your own, your own singing, but it's coming. Let's see if these work. Just a small town girl. Oh, it's getting close. Living in a lonely... And by the way, I love the fact that it's a small town girl. What is that anyway? What is a girl? 303-696-1971. My thanks to Arash and Ted. Um, honest to God, I really do think there's a podcast in there. Uh, great couple. And I love the fact that they are willing to bring the heat, uh, not just on air to us, but to each other. It sounds like they hold each other accountable for the disagreements that they have and why they do it. I thought those the questions were great. We should do more of that, in my opinion. But I want to know what you think about that. As we talk about the State of the Union, have not had um, your feedback yet. We've had some text here, but a couple questions come to mind. One, did you watch it? If not, why not? But if you did, and you're the better caller for me, what did you hear there? Uh, you know, when we talk to Ted, one of the things that makes Ted credible to me is his willingness to admit certain things that we agree with. And for instance, this particular clip that we played here, you remember what Ted said about it. I'm going to play it again to get your feedback. Give us a call, 303-696-1971. Have you noticed Big Oil just reported his profits, record profits? Last year, they made $200 billion in the midst of a global energy crisis. I think it's outrageous. Why? They invested too little of that profit to increase domestic production. And when I talk to a couple of them, they say, well, we're afraid you're going to shut down all the oil wells and all the uh, oil refineries anyway, so why should we invest in them? I said, we're going to need oil for at least another decade. And that's going to exceed. <laughs> and beyond that, we're going to need it. That was laugh out loud funny. And I do think that that was an unintentional, uh, unscripted moment. We're going to need you for another decade. But then after that, folks, it's all sun and wind. Boo! 
Um, but what I appreciate about Ted on his comment was I thought it was a cheap shot. I thought it was a mistake. He should have said something else. We're going to need oil and gas for what he said that in the future, uh, that's open to discussion. I don't disagree with that entirely, but, um, I thought that was what made Ted credible and, you know, the 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 idea here, I think, is that Joe Biden, much like Homer Simpson does from time to time, said the stuff that's supposed to be kept up inside in your head. I presume that's really what the Democrats think, that in 10 years we should be done with fossil fuels. If we're the country that does that first, we instantly, instantly become the weakest country on the planet Earth. Because if we are completely beholden to just wind and solar, it's bye bye time. Right. I mean, every other country on the planet would have the ability to produce more, more, more quickly and in more places across the globe, not us. And let's be real. We have zero impact on the environment if we do that. Zero impact, negligible at best, because China and India and uh, developing Africa, they'll continue to put out the different uh, factories that produce all this, that and the other. And oh, by the way, the batteries, that's another thing right there. Um, but we've got some text come in here. Uh, an important fact to keep it. This is our buddy, Alexa. Important fact to keep in mind, the more immigration, the larger the drug cartel, but trafficking along with the happenings of the immigrants, no doubt about it. And, and I should, I'm going to tease you here with a little, this little foreshadowing. Uh, the good folks here at 710, me included, are going to be focusing pretty intensely on the border immigration issue in the future. I don't know that I'm authorized to say more than that, Billy. So I just, I guess I kind of want to tease that and in the not too distant future, and it'll be pretty awesome. The right needs to scream that we need to stop illegal immigration so we can help save many people a day from human and sex trafficking, at least eight Coloradans a day from dying due to fentanyl. Is it up to eight? I mean, it had been like four or five. That's ridiculous. Just like the exponential growth of homeless and crime, it is going to be hard to reduce all of these problems. Last I heard, drug cartels just don't give up their business. Frankly, that's true. And the, the drug cartels, this is what we found, at least while I was district attorney here of this, uh, really, honestly, let's be honest, the, the most significant district attorney's office in the region of the country. However, what we've discovered is there is an easy transition from drugs to peeps. That human trafficking thing is a self-replenishing source. Like you get caught with drugs by the feds you're in trouble instantly. There is no, eh, it's for personal use. That kind of, You're going to get busted. Now, here in the state of Colorado, we have largely decriminalized. And by largely, I mean the consequences for illegal drug possession and use are silly. It's almost civil in nature. Uh, we've set up a system here where we basically said we don't care. Uh, we have started to say we care again with fentanyl. But remember, we still created that misdemeanor version for one gram or less of fentanyl. So, I mean, if you can kill 500 people with it, mm, misdemeanor, right? But this is what we found is it, because uh, possession of drugs is not self-replenishing, you got to keep going and you got to keep getting that, um, that supply train of it, whether it's produced here locally. And that's, you don't need to do that anymore because it's so easy to come across our Southern border. Um, that's a risk, right? You got to keep going. But human people like the human trafficking people and yeah i've heard that there's the labor trafficking that's legit but honestly the one that's the most insidious in my mind are the the kids and the men and the women who get trafficked for sex that's a self-replenishing source and you don't get caught with them like on, in your pocket or on your person and you get in trouble you're able to walk a block behind them while you have your bottom b i'm not going to say the full word on air here uh you know run uh, run sheep herder on them basically. And you get to run that kind of a business making a lot of money and you don't have to worry about losing your source. You don't have to worry about losing the supply. That's the other part of the illegal immigration. And, and frankly, I feel like the this administration's not just straight up ignorance, but it's willingness to refuse to do anything meaningful. Everything they've done at this point feels optic to me, like so they can say they've done something. We're increasing the number of border guards. What about stay? What about stay in the country from which you came? What about making asylum seekers actually follow national and international law on seeking asylum? You don't get to call your shot. You don't get to say, oh, I'm in El Salvador. I'd really like to seek asylum in America. That's not how it works. You must seek asylum in the country closest to you. We don't hear any discussion of that. 
The president's reference to the border, in my opinion, was because he was obligated to say something about it and make it seem like they're doing something. I don't care if they add more border guards. That's not the only answer. The fact that they were trying to undo President Trump's very effective policies, not perfect, but very effective, that tells you where their head and their heart is. And at the end of the day, what they're looking to do is to change the electorate. You know this is about power. You and I know that. This is not about anybody. This is about power at the end of the day. And so these failures here, these failures are intended. They're deliberate. This isn't, hey, I'm going in there trying to stop illegal immigration and I'm just not effective at it. They don't want to stop illegal immigration, folks. I haven't seen any indication of that at all. 303-696-1971. Here's uh, something... Someone's trying to, uh, and I'll read the text here. Um, They've said, George, you clearly reject transgendered people. Why? And I said, reject, huh? They say you don't think it exists. Yes, keep ridiculing transgendered people. Not a good look. If you can name the part where I ridiculed them, uh, call in and let us know if you have the guts to do it. I haven't ridiculed any transgender person. Uh, I responded with, you can call yourself whatever you want, but does what you call yourself change a biological fact? And the response was biology made a mistake. Who says, who says biology made a mistake? Should those people be trapped in the wrong body? Listen, man, I, I, you can do anything you want to yourself. I have no problems with that. You can call yourself whatever you want, but society's response should not have to be to redefine a term that has been in existence as long as we have been in existence to accommodate those choices. Now, you may say to yourself, it's not a choice. This is who I am. Okay, uh, fine. That's fine. We're not going to redefine gender uh, to to fit that. It just doesn't strike me. It doesn't strike me as making sense. That doesn't mean you can't be respected as a person. It doesn't mean we can't make certain accommodations for you. But to bend society to the will of a handful of people, does that make sense? I I don't know. Here's one thought. uh, Thought lawyers were taught to be open minded. Where in the world did you get that crack smoke crazy idea that lawyers were taught to be open minded? Never one time on the it ever in education was I taught to be open minded. What I was taught to do was to have the ability to argue either side of an issue, depending upon who your client was. That ain't open minded. That's just the ability to pivot, shift, adopt information and then zealously fight for who your client is. Uh, but where did you get that idea? Law, lawyer, lawyers were taught to be open minded. That's crazy. Isn't it amazing? As a liberal, you hear and grade both speeches, Biden Huckabee, one way, and conservatives hear the opposite. We are so decide. I think what you're saying is we're so divided. I think that's what you were trying to say. I agree, man. I think a lot of people hear what they want to hear. Uh, I, I'm a conservative. I like Sarah Huckabee Sanders. I think she's going to be a force to be reckoned with in the future. I really do. Um, but I'm happy to say the content was grade A and that portions of the delivery just, man, they just didn't do it for me. And again, if, if you have to be a Kool-Aid drinker to cheer it on, that it just ain't, ain't me. On the other hand, I, I criticize almost the entirety of the content of Biden's speech. But do I think he had moments where it was effective and clever? Yeah, I do. I don't, <laughs> I'm sure some of you will be out there and be like, if you can't criticize every breath he takes, you're a rhino. That's not how it works. Uh, What I am is capable of criticism of both and trying to get to a better place here. Um, Here's some more. In regards to your discussion right now with knowing the difference between a man and a woman in the Bible, God created Eve for Adam and Adam for Eve, not Adam for Adam and Eve for Eve. That's not a transgendered reference. That is not a gendered reference. That is referencing homosexuals. And I think that that's different. Um, I think that just we're at a place in society where I get what some people point to in the Bible. I just don't think we're there anymore. Ted and Arash, I completely respect both of them. I respect and, and honor their their choice to be married, to be, I, I, you know, I, I'm not of the same mind when it comes to that. And you heard that even with Arash when he asked Ted the question, can you define what a woman is? I think Arash is in that same place. 
Um, gender is just a biologic fact. Now, Billy had said, and I don't want to turn this into an entire conversation on this, but Billy had said when we were talking off air, there's just a distinction. And I just don't think most Americans get that distinction. Billy, let's do this because of where we're at. Yeah. Let's cut away. <laughs> when we come idea. back in the eight, we're going to head dick. But I do want to have this conversation yeah. with you. We can do it afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we'll have Alpine when we come back. Let me just do a quick smart thing here. And that is to tell you about our buddy Mitch Flory at the Art of Granite. Uh, Mitch Floria is the bomb and in all the best possible ways. You're talking immigration. Here's a dude that did it legally way back when he was a young man escaping communist Romania under Ceausescu, if you remember that. Guy comes here with the American DNA coursing through his veins, man, becomes a citizen the right way and ends up starting a business, a small business. So he's not dependent upon or beholden to government. He's creating jobs, creating tax base. We love this guy. Honor those things. When you're thinking about upgrading the interior of your kitchen or your bathroom by upgrading that countertop, look to Mitch. His business is called the Art of Granite. It has a T in it, but it's not just granite. It's marble. It's quartz. It is uh, it is granite, of course. All those other things you might make a counter out of. This guy can do it. He's a craftsman. He's a great businessman. And if, frankly, if you mention KNUS, you get deals. And some of those deals include bathroom sinks for free with the purchase or kitchen sinks for free with the purchase of any countertop package, discounts on labor. That's because he thinks like you do here. He's got the same values you do. Small business should be our focus. No knock on the big box store guys. No knock on the other guys who just work on just straight up uh, quantity. This is a quality driven business. Be part of it. Give them a call at 303-386-5919, 303-386-5919. That rings the phone on his hip or you check them out at the Art of Granite. Art and Granite both have T's in them, theartofgranite.com. When we come back, our buddies at Alpine Planning, George Brockler with the George Show 710 KNUS.
George Brockler right back with you here. Final few minutes of the 7 o'clock hour. And you know what that means. It's time to get more smartly with our good buddy Gabe from Alpine Planning. Gabe, are you on the slopes? I am not, sir. I'm on the way to work. I, I'm going to keep it short today because I heard you're having what? Billy take over the mic. Well, not on purpose, but yes. So what's going on? <laughs> what, are, are we getting rich today or what's the word? Not today, sir. We're starting off relatively flat, but technically in the red this morning, George. Uh, currently have the Dow down 65, the S&P is off 20, and the NASDAQ is off 73. But this is coming off a couple of uh, uh, days of rally. The Dow actually snapped a three-day losing streak yesterday after some remarks by Fed Chair Powell. But as we've kind of now halfway through earnings season, so to speak, uh, George, what has been encouraging is although the results aren't as rosy as they normally are, as yeah. an example, uh, not as many companies are, are beating estimates and, and a lot are actually lowering guidance. I think uh, you, you're getting a, a good surprise in this thing, in the sense things aren't as bad as, as a lot of investors thought, uh, which is why you've seen markets kind of surge over the last five to six weeks here with S&P up uh, over 8% so far this year. Uh, and so I do think it's an opportunity for investors that, you know, stayed the course, uh, stayed invested, and, and, and gained a little bit of interest back on their money of, okay, how are we positioned over the next one to two years, given that there are a lot of risks out there with Ukraine, with a potential recession looming, um, and so for our clients specifically, we've been making a lot of shifts more so than we would normally, uh, but that's just what the times call for. Well, so, uh, you know, I listened to the state of the union speech last night. Did you do that? I did watch parts of it. Yes. Yeah. Now to hear the president talk about it, it sounds like things are going really pretty well. But then when I read the wall street journal and some other things, there are these lingering concerns about the inflation stuff. I mean, what's the next thing you're looking for that'll be reported that might give us an indication of which direction we're headed? So, well, uh, you know, next week we are going to get the January CPI report. And I think that will, you know, give a little bit of uh, guidance on, you know, where we're going. Uh, Fed Chair Powell did, did say that the deflationary process is, is sort of begun, but, Honestly, George, I think there are a lot of risks out there that, that weren't talked about last night, right? Even with, it's kind of a conundrum of, of information that we're in, because last week you come out, unemployment's really low, a lot of jobs are being created. But on the other side, inflation is up, you have a lot of tech uh, workers being laid off, um, you have a lot of big time investors saying, hey, you know, sell your assets, things are going to crash. So, there's just a whirlwind of noise right now. And so I think what investors need to do is put themselves in a position where, okay, if the markets go up and my long-term money is going to grow as I need it to, but protect myself in the short term, especially for the next few quarters and potentially the next 12 to 18 months. Man, that's just wisdom from our buddy Gabe. You can get more of that. Alpine Planning Group is a comprehensive financial planning firm committed to improving your long-term financial success. Investing, as always, a matter of trust. They're prepared to earn yours. Call them today, 303-843-0918, 303-843-0918. Thank you, Gabe. You be well, sir. See you, buddy. Securities and investment advisory services offered through Woodbury Financial Services, Inc., member FINRA SIPC and registered investment advisor. Alpine Planning Group and Woodbury Financial Services, Inc. are not affiliated entities. 14 West Dry Creek Circle, Littleton, Colorado, 80120. Listen, based on the text, we're not quite done talking about the state of the union as more of them come in. Pick up that phone and call, but not right away because we're going to have Uncle Dick on next. George Brockler, George Show, 710 KNUS.
We are halfway there through hump day. It is February the 8th. I am George Brockler on the George Show 710 KNUS. Last night, of course, the State of the Union address. We had a great conversation in the last hour with Arash and Ted. We're going to continue that conversation with a guest who has assured us he can be here all hour. No, I'm kidding, Dick. I know you got to go at 820. Uh, Dick Wadhams, sir, thanks for joining us. Thank you, George, for having me back. Now, I presume that you watched the State of the Union. Did you also watch the response by Sarah Huckabee Sanders, Governor Sanders? I did. I watched both the speech itself and also her response. Let's talk about the Biden speech first. What is your reaction? What are your thoughts? What stuck out to you? You know, George, I kept thinking, sitting there watching him, is that uh, beyond all the issues that were covered, all the the debates that that he engaged in with Republicans, that no one could look at that president last night and say to themselves, is this man capable of being president for six more years? And he's still got two left on this term, and he presumably is running for a, another four-year term. He looked, he looks old. He slurred his words at times. He called uh, Chuck Schumer, the Senate minority leader. Um, there were times, we, and you've talked about it, that the words he used were in, incomprehensible. Uh, and then you look over his shoulder and you see the number two person in the administration, uh, Kamala Harris, and you're thinking, neither one oh, of these people are up to the job. Oh, and I, I, just, I just don't think he made any um, any uh, impact at all in terms of, inc- of improving his political situation. Thirty Only 32 percent of Democrats want him to run again. Uh, that's that says it all to me. What's interesting is uh, there's a recently released since we've been on the air here, uh, I think a CNN poll. Not take that for what it's worth, but a CNN poll that found that 72 percent of Americans who watch President Joe Biden's State of the Union had a positive reaction to the speech, which also included 43 percent of, I presume, self-described Republicans. Now, that's not out of line with past no. state of the unions at all it's not like that blows the doors off of anything but it's something why is that why do so many at least through this poll think it was a positive speech well i mean listen uh, i i thought uh, your earlier guest uh, i said it best uh, the the bar is low uh he didn't walk up there and trip over himself or or um, he, he wasn't totally incoherent i mean the bar is so low for joe biden that um uh, I just think people gave him the benefit of the doubt uh, last night. Does it have any, st- any staying power? No, it does not. No, but he's um, not going to get a big bump in the polls and go from 41 to something. No, and he's not going to get, I don't think there's going to be this rallying around him even by Democrats. Like, we need you back, Joe. Joe. Um, uh, I think the Democrats have a dilemma on their hands. Uh, they've got to come to grips with the 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 failed guy they have in, in, in office right now who cannot win a national election unless it is uh, unless it is uh, Donald Trump on the Republican side. And by the way, George, if if we have to endure another Trump-Biden campaign in 2024, oh boy. wow, what a failure our two parties have both become. Listen, uh, Rocky II was not as good as Rocky I. Creed II, pretty good. Honestly, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, better than Star Trek, uh, the the motion picture, but I can't see this sequel being one that's super awesome for anybody that's out there. When you listen to the speech, and he did not name his predecessor, but he did refer to his predecessor. Other than that, were there parts of the speech that you thought were effective? And if so, what were they? And then I'll ask you about what you thought the lowlights were. Well, I thought that he, he, did, he was rather skillful in turning the Social Security Medicare issue back towards Republicans, um, and uh, he kind of ad-libbed that. And I thought that was, the, although it's disingenuous, I mean, Republicans are not, as a party, calling for Social Security and Medicare to be cut. I mean, that's one guy, uh, Senator Scott from Florida, who came up with that crazy idea. Um, and, and yet, George, there is a, the Washington Post this week talked about how there are going to have to be some alterations made to Social Security and Medicare. They cannot go uh, as they are right now uh, and be financially stable. So uh, it's still an issue to, to, to be talked about. 
There's some other stuff that he said in here. I, I've identified as just things that are that just really bug the hell out of me. But what were the things that he said that you thought were just cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs or just contrary to the facts? Well, I mean, when he talks about how uh, every, the, the economy is just all rosy right now, I mean, you tell that to people who are still suffering from high inflation. And um, I mean, I, the voters have said, uh, in poll after poll, that they have no confidence in this president. He, he, the only people, people who support him on the economy is the Democratic base. Um, he, it's something like uh, disapproval of uh, 60 percent or higher. He, he has. Um, so when he talks about the economy, I just don't think people believe it. But the other thing, George, is what he didn't say. I mean, he barely touched on, on um, the border, as you've talked about. Yep. He barely touched on drugs. He barely touched on crime, which is a national crisis right now. Um, he's not living in the real world. He also says, and I'm going to read you from from the transcript here. I don't, just don't have this sound clipped, but he says, um, well, you know what? I'll play this sound right after this. He After he talks about the need for increased regulation and government control of almost everything, he says, look, I'm a capitalist. I'm a capitalist. But you pay your fair share. Uh, and then he, at one point he says, the tax system is not fair. It is not fair. And then he says this. Pass my proposal for the billionaire minimum tax. You know, there's a thousand billionaires in America. It's up from about 600 in the beginning of the term. But no billionaire should be paying a lower tax rate than a school teacher or firefighter. Well, I mean it. Think about it. Of course, the uh, the old crutches, I mean it, think about it, listen, folks, all those things in almost every sentence. But here's what's crazy. Dude has been in Congress since January 1973 for 46 years or 36 years yeah. and then became vice president. This is Joe Biden's tax code. If he thinks it's unfair, he's only got to look in the mirror to figure out how it happened. And, and the vast majority of that time in the Senate, George, he was in the Senate my, majority. Um, uh, that's all there is to it. And you're, you're dead right about that. The, the other thing that disgusted me was his, um, uh, uh, discussion of, um, oil companies and their, uh, allegedly obscene profits when, and then saying, well, we're, we're going to need oil for only the next 10 years. I know, know you talked about that, <laughs> so funny. but I got, but it is so disingenuous when, when the democratic party as a, as a whole is hell bent on killing the fossil fuels industry. And and, um, and and forcing higher prices and more expensive um, uh, vehicles on uh, on people. Uh, it is it, it, it should, that it, that was probably the most reprehensible rep, rep, reprehensible moment for me last night. And, and he's going to do it here. Listen to this with taxpayer money. We're going to build five hundred thousand electric vehicle charging stations installed across the country by tens of thousands of IBW workers. And. We're helping families save more than $1,000 a year with tax credits to purchase electric vehicles and efficient, and efficient appliances, energy efficient appliances. Yeah, so we're going to, and, and remember his little throw there, his little homage to unions. This may be the most pro-union president we've seen, at least overtly, in my lifetime. No, there's no doubt about it. Um, and of course, the common theme with the entire speech was more government, more government, more government. I loved what Dana Perino said last night. She said, you know, Bill Clinton famously said the era of big government is over. Well, last night, the, the era of big government is definitely back after we heard Biden. Yeah, I agree with that, too. Um, when you look at the Sarah Huckabee Sanders response, give me your thoughts on that. I thought it was good, George, although I am. Um, I think it was a little too caustic at times, and I know a lot of people like that. But uh, and I think there probably should have been more focus on um, uh, on some of the fundamental issues like crime and once again drug abuse of the border. Um, I, I, she hit, she had a lot on the cultural issues, and listen, those are going to be a big issues in the presidential campaign in 2024. But uh, I think um, I wish she would have spent a little bit more time on the economic issues and and crime issues, frankly. Do, do these speeches strike you as trying to appeal to uh, broader Americans or are they each, or maybe they're different, focused on really the base? 
Well, I think Biden is trying to convince Democrats that he should be the nominee. Um, I think he knows that down deep, Democrats are very uneasy about him. Um, and so uh, that's why I think he took such a, such a strong, big government, pro-union, as you point out, uh, approach last night. Um, but but um, so I, th- I think it was, uh, and, and, then atta- and then going after Republicans at times, although he was he was gracious in the beginning. I will say the way he made the joke about with McCarthy, McCarthy, I thought, did excellent last night, by the way. I mean, he was gracious himself. He looked uh, he looked like the Speaker of the House. He glared at those idiot, uh, idiot Republicans who were yelling at Biden, which should not happen. He didn't tear um, up any speeches. <laughs> no. And he, yes, exactly. I mean, that was one of the low points of any state of the union when Nancy Pelosi did that uh, against Trump. And, and by the way, Democrats heckled Trump, too, and that wasn't right either. Um, so I, um, uh, I, 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 I guess Biden, maybe he accomplished what he wanted to tonight in, in hitting all those big government themes that turn on Democrats. But overall, I still don't think he really moved the ball down the field. There was one other thing that he says in here, and I talked with Ted and Arash about it as well. And it was this particular clip, and I want to get your feedback on it. All of you at home should know what those plans are. Instead of making the wealthy pay their fair share, some Republicans, some Republicans want Medicare and Social Security to sunset. I'm not saying it's a majority. Let me give you, anybody who doubts it, contact my office. I'll give you a copy. I'll give you a copy of the proposal. He follows that up by saying after the booing, hey, sounds like we've got consensus. We're not going to touch Social Security or Medicare. We're going to protect it. What were your thoughts on that? I thought was that Rick Scott did did Republicans a lot of damage a year ago when he just arbitrarily went out there and announced that that was the Republican agenda uh, to sunset uh, Social Security and Medicare. Um, He really did. He hurt Senate candidates. Uh, around the country, and he and he heard a lot of candidates. Uh, that, that was that was uh, demagoguery on, in my opinion, by Biden last night to basically hold all Republicans accountable for that. Um, and it's interesting when when they squad when they make anti-Semitic comments and other stupid things, uh, and and Republicans attack the squad. Democrats say, "Well, that's just a couple of people. That's not that doesn't represent the entire Republican Party." Well, last night Biden hung the entire Republican Party on the words of Rick Scott. And that's not fair either. I did think, and I asked Ted about this and Arash agreed. I I do think that that sort of, um, I'm describing it as judo using the other side's momentum against him Mm -hmm. when they, I thought that was clever. I don't know how effective it was. I thought it was clever. And I thought it probably sent a message that this guy may not be as uh, wrapped up in dementia or whatever it is we're thinking is going on there. than we thought that that took some cleverness. No, George, uh, like we talked earlier, I I thought that was probably his best moment last night, uh, as as disgusting as it was. Um, I thought he he, he was thinking on his feet. He went off script and uh, he he made he he made a a fairly effective uh, debating point against Republicans last night uh, in that even though it was false, a false talking point, he, he did that well. One other thing I hadn't told you I was going to ask you about, but I know you've been paying attention to this. The the DNC, the Democrat National folks, have changed yeah. up historically the order of the primaries yeah. and the caucuses that are out there. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it shows that he is nervous about his own renomination. Uh, we all know that South Carolina essentially nominated him in 2020, um, in the 2020 election. Um, and... Um, after he did so dismally in New Hampshire and Iowa, and they revived his candidacy uh, by putting South Carolina first, basically knocking Iowa out of the, the mix and, uh, and downgrading New Hampshire. He's basically saying, I'm, I want this calendar to reflect, uh, to reflect my strength, not somebody else's. Um, uh, Iowa, I, th- I think Iowa and New Hampshire are going to say, screw you, uh, Biden. We're going to go ahead and work. Iowa's going to go ahead and have their caucuses early. New Hampshire has a state law that says we are the first primary. They do. So I think they're I think I think they're going to go forward. Now, if that happens, do, do the Democrats call their bluff and say, hey, then we're just not going to count you or I don't know what tools they have in their toolbox to do that. But 
do they have the ability to strip them of some relevance when it comes to the nominating process? I believe they do. They can strip them uh, uh, the, uh, half of their delegation, for instance, or something like that. I don't think they, they, they would be playing with fire to basically refuse to seat the delegation. But um, I'll bet you in the end, uh, George, that Democrats back off, that Georgia, Iowa will be allowed to go first and that New Hampshire will precede South Carolina. I just I, because Democrats in Iowa and New Hampshire are saying we are not going to pay attention to your rules, DNC. We're still going to go first. I think the other one that's kind of lurking there in the background is Georgia. And what I've heard is they wanted to move Georgia up in the mix and do some other stuff. And it sounds like Brad Raffensperger has the ability to undo that selection himself. And there's no reason to suggest, even for those folks that think that he was anti-Trump or whatever, kind of irrelevant, still a Republican, that he may not play ball with that and he may upend that part of the apple card. Yeah, uh, the Secretary of State in Georgia does have the power to make that decision. And uh, I, uh, I I bet he will. In fact, he's indicated he will, I call. Uh, interesting times ahead. I'm glad we have your uh, willingness to risk any credibility that you currently have and any future credibility that you may earn by coming on the show. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, George. Nice to be with you. Good good to see you again. Hey, that's Dick Wadhams. Uh, by the way, when I say see it, yeah, that's a slip. But here's what I think we're trying to do, and I'm really talking to, to Mark and Blake on this. Someday and in the very near future, we're going to figure out a way to do sort of the uh, – I don't know if it's FaceTime, WhatsApp, whatever those things are, where you're going to be able to see me and the person that I'm talking to, or at least a still image of them with some sort of glamour shot. You know what I mean? That sort of faded one that makes me look like I'm only 35 when clearly I'm several years older than that. Uh, I want to get some of your feedback on that as well. Do you agree? What did you hear in the State of the Union? What did you hear with the Sarah Huckabee Sanders response you grade these things a b c i presume that a lot of republicans out there and conservatives will say this was an f but why what what do you make of the cnn poll that 72 percent of those americans who viewed it yes it's a cnn poll found it to be pretty positive including 43 percent of republicans maybe you're one of the republicans that thinks the same way you can call and you don't have to use your real name. You can use some version of Billy and use that to mask really, even if you're a woman, frankly, I, I don't care. Give us a call, 303-696-1971. Uh, if you're suffering, and I don't mean just through the State of the Union, but if you're suffering from the kind of pain that just, it ekes into your joints, it's the kind of thing where you get up in the morning and it's the grab of the neck or it's the back, it's the shoulders, it's the knees, it's the ankles. Your warranty may have run out, folks, on that body. Despite the fact that we're living longer and better, uh, that doesn't mean that everything is going to work the way it should all the time. You got a couple options. One, you could go the old route, the old classic route. Go see your doctor, and when he says we need to cut into you and put things and take things out of your joints, it's going to take a whole bunch of recovery time. You could do that. You could do that. There's probably nothing wrong with that, but there's something righter about going a different direction. Why don't you get that second opinion from our buddies at QC Kinetics? Uh, I spent a long time on the phone with them learning about the process. And I got to say, these are the people I would give a call to when I get to that place. Now, mercifully, and thank God, knock on wood, um, I'm not there yet. But I know it's coming because I think I've inherited a lot of my dad's joints. And my dad has had a lot of work done on him. I wish QC Kinetics had been around when he went under the knife to do things like, oh, the scope the replacement of the knee, all that other stuff. Uh, these are folks that will make the pain part go away more quickly. The recovery, uh, no downtime, by the way, the recovery much quicker. And that's because they're using you to fix you. Think about that when you think about regenerative medicine, using you to fix you. And the, here's the cool part. Free consultation with a local medical professional. All you got to do is pick up the number, three zero. call the number 303-989-86. 303-900-8986. And I'm just going to say it one more time for the fun of it because you're writing it down. 303-900-8986. That's QC Kinetics. Listen, uh, when we come back, it's going to be you as the phone lines start to fill up here. Uh, we're also going to have a conversation with our good buddy, the district attorney for the mightiest, most impressive jurisdiction in the state of Colorado about something I talked to you about at the end of yesterday's show. It's George Brockler on The George Show, 710 KNUS. Sir, hey, that's John Kellner. Look, going to cut away for a break. 
When we come back with what time we have left, I'll get to the phone if it's fair. Don, Don and everybody else on hold. I don't want to take a call if all I'm giving you is 30 seconds. That's just not fair to you for having stayed on. So we'll do it, of course, at the top of the hour. There's a phone line open at 303-696-1971. Very, very important that I tell you about another superstar in the law game. A guy, by the way, who's a big fan of John's. His name's Dan Kaplis. Uh, he and Babar Wahid have a law firm. I see their ads running on TV now, on Fox News. And it's true. They are a serious firm for serious cases. And the reason for that is there are other firms out there that will try to make a mountain out of a molehill and will allow people who have a slip and fall and maybe it's not that big of an and they're out there trying to exploit this. That's not these guys. These are the guys that you bring in when it matters. These are the guys that you bring in when you have been hurt and your quality of your life has been reduced. Your life has been changed inalterably. From the negligence, the recklessness, maybe even the intentional conduct of another person, a business, doesn't matter. When you need to have someone that stands up for you and fights against the bully, and you know who I'm talking about, who the bully is, then you go to Dan and Bobber because they've been doing it forever. I mean, Dan's been practicing law long enough. He's seen it all. Everyone out there on the other side knows this guy and what he's willing to do. And what he's willing to do is to go to trial. The cost is irrelevant to Dan and Bobber. What's important to them is making sure they get you justice. So here's what you do. When you need justice, you pick up the phone and you call 303-770-5551, 303-770-5551, or you check them out at dancaplislaw.com, dancaplislaw.com. When we come back, you, me, phones, texts, all of it. George Brocco, George Show, 710, KNUS.
I don't know how else to say it other than 10 seconds till we cut away and 9 o'clock becomes you, Don, and everybody else at 303-696-1971. George Brockler, 710, Can you ask? Want to take your favorite radio station wherever you go? Well, now there's an app for that. No matter where you are, stream your favorite shows. Tap the app to listen to podcasts. Talk back to your favorite local hosts. At the tone, leave a message. Call the show. Set your alarm. Enter contests and win prizes. All in the palm of your hand. Available now for iOS and Android devices in the App Store or Google Play. And best of all, it's free. Download today.
For those listening on the podcast, it is a little PJ Pearl Jam here live on 710 KNUS. George Brockler back with you. We are happy to be joined by yet another VIP. If you haven't read National Review, what is wrong with you? I've been reading this thing. My dad introduced this to me when I became of political awareness age, which was somewhere in the teens. I can't remember anymore. And uh, I think there's still a box in the basement that has, I mean, dozens of these, uh, the National Review in print in boxes from way back during the Reagan era to join us to have a conversation about the State of the Union. Dan McLaughlin. Dan, thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. Dan, uh, let's do this because there are folks out there that know who you are and there are folks that don't, but I always like to do this with guests. Give us a little bit of your background. And when I say background, not just the professional stuff, but where did you grow up? Where'd you go to high school? Did you do any sports? That kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, uh, I am a basically lifelong New York girl. I did go to high school in, in uh, North Jersey. Um, uh, I have been, uh, politically, I've been writing for national, well, I've been blogging since about 2000. Um, wow. and, and Kate brought my writing over to national review in 2016 and went full time into the business in 2020. So I was for 23 years, I was practicing lawyer. Um, what? And what? Doing well, the, well, hang on, hang on back up, man, because I'm a lawyer too. Where, uh, oh, where did you go to law school? Uh, Harvard. So I was, well, I, uh, I, I don't know where that is. Is that the Connecticut one? Yeah, it's a, it's a little place in Massachusetts. So, uh, yeah, no, I, so I was, I was for two decades, I was doing both at the same time, writing and, and doing, uh, doing the law. So what kind of law? Um, mostly, uh, you know, securities litigation, class action defense, uh, largely defending like wall street, uh, you know, against investor lawsuits, that sort of thing. I presume that's like a $20 an hour gig. Yeah, a little something like that. So <laughs> now listen, the, uh, <laughs> For Harvard, hang on. For Harvard, they have that statue, and you know what I'm talking about, in kind of that quad area. And everybody comes up and rubs the toe of the shoe. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that's the, uh, well, it's the college, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that particular statue, do you know the story behind why you don't rub the shoe? I think I probably heard it you know, uh, 25, 30 years ago, but I don't remember so it today. Back in the day, you know, when your kids all think, Hey, someday I'm going to go to Harvard and they don't realize you got to be like Dan McLaughlin quality to get in there. Um, th we took a tour and a friend of ours had a, a niece that was going there and she told us, and, and there's all of these tourists going up there, rubbing the toe and it's supposedly for good luck. And they take pictures of themselves rubbing the toe. And she's like, whatever you do, never rub the toe because the guys here, that know that all these tourists rub the toe, they get liquored up and they climb onto the thing and whiz all over that toe <laughs> and, and on Saturdays and Fridays. And I'm like, this is the kind of insider information you don't get from the welcome to Harvard handbook or so you think you want to go her handbook. So anyway, I, I just share that with you in case you go back. Um, man, you, uh, you have been following the State of the Union. This isn't the first one you've watched. What did you see last night? Good and bad? I mean, is there anything you can say, listen, I give him credit for this. Well, I mean, I think first, first of all, I mean, uh, Biden's delivery was definitely, you know, uh, better than his uh, his usual level these days. Obviously, I have to qualify it by these days because if you've watched Joe Biden over the years, he's, uh, you know, he's visibly not the same man he was not 10 years all. ago or not certainly not, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, I mean, it was obvious, you know, even the New York Times sort of trying to lower expectations ahead of time said, Oh, you know, Joe took out all the numbers and the hard to pronounce words and stuff. And you could see he did that some of last, last night. He pulls up like when he's like, you know, welcome to the Ukrainian ambassador. And he sounds like he's about to give her name. And then he's like, uh, Mrs. Miss ambassador. So he just he clearly was not going to attempt to pronounce that one. And there were some um, words in there too, that just became sounds, right? Like there were no syllables. They just kind of blurred into a series of sounds. And I had some texters earlier today, Dan say, well, he stutters. And I'm like, nah, it's not a stutter. And that's not the way he sounded 10 or 20 years ago. This is different. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, people said, well, you know, George W. Bush couldn't really talk. You know, Donald Trump couldn't be presidential. But, you know, these guys, these guys were typically able to pull it together for the big set piece speeches. And the same is true of Biden. You know, they're able to get him. You know, I'm sure he probably took an afternoon nap. He was, you know, he was he was about <laughs> as alert as uh, as he's going to get at this point. So, 
uh, in that sense, I mean, and, and, you know, I think the speech was in some way shrewd because one thing that was very, very conspicuous is that, you know, the, the speech starts at, at nine o'clock yeah. and, and I was looking at my watch and like, you know, 10 Oh five Biden, Biden finally t- starts talking about social issues, uh, which has been enormous focus of his administration in practice. Uh, and at 10 Oh six, he's done with it. And then, and then he gets to the foreign policy section of the speech where he doesn't really talk about, uh, you know, he doesn't really make any sort of case for, for aid to Ukraine. He just sort of, you know, waves his hand at Ukraine. He hardly talks about China at all. It never uh, mentions the word balloon. No, certainly not the balloon. So, you know, uh, I mean, he sort of he sort of rushed through uh, the foreign policy section and really rushed through the social issue section uh, and tried to focus on a more sort of economically populist, uh, you know, here's something for you and here's something for you kind of section of the speech. I think the most important goal that Biden had, though, in this speech, and I wrote about it this yesterday ahead of time, is that right now Biden's chief focus is on making sure that he doesn't get challenged within That's the Democratic great Party. Point. Great point. Because, because you know, he is, he is, I mean, Democrats are sort of resigned to him to some extent, certainly the official apparatus of the party, but poll after poll shows that majorities of Democratic voters do not want this guy to run again. They they would choose somebody else if they're offered another choice. And so what Biden is trying to do is to cut off every possible avenue of attack that somebody could use to primary. Did he do it? Do you feel like he was successful? I think he moved the ball in that sense. I mean, I think he, he I mean, he is definitely trying, I think, also a little bit to get into general election mode of, you know, just kind of talking, talking about, you know, sort of small ball economic issue you know kitchen table issues which is a real change from you know throughout the midterm elections biden was heavily focused heavily focused and it may have worked on you know let's not talk about the economy uh you know let's talk entirely about an attack on democracy an attack Donald trump january 6th yeah attack on democracy ultra maga and all this stuff um you know, and now he's now he's sort of switching gears because that that did kind of work in the midterms. Right. I mean, you could see that that, you know, certainly from the polls and the turnout numbers. And I've done some deep dives into this. Um, you know, it was a very Republican electorate that turned out. It was very much the kind of people who show up in midterm elections. And yet we didn't uh, do that fundamentally. Well. Yeah. It was it was people that, you know, it was people that didn't like Trump. Uh, and and didn't like a lot of the very Trump kinds of candidates uh, that Republicans were running. We're talking to Dan McLaughlin the, uh, from the go to uh, the National Review. Um, when you look at the speech yesterday, in part, it struck me that the other goal and, and, and you hit it pretty well on the head. And that is this guy gets the benefit of low expectations, right? Like if he didn't stand up there at the podium and either nod off, wet himself or forget where he was, it's a win. And the other thing he was able to do, whether it was nap driven or not, is he was able to go longer than an hour in the speech. Had it been much shorter, I imagine people go, well, he doesn't have the staying power, couldn't even hit an hour. So he goes into that hour 15 ish kind of range. And I think it's an attempt to dispel this fact that he is an old guy guy going through old guy changes was he effective there yeah no i mean i think certainly uh you know there wasn't there wasn't a tailing off that would produce a you know kind of viral moment because obviously so much of what you know the audiences for these things are not huge these days Uh -uh. so so much of what happens in really any kind of political speech these days is designed for viral moments um and you know, the clip that will make its rounds on the on the news or on the on the on the web, on Twitter. Um, and I think that, that Biden was, you know, in part by playing to the Republican, responding to the Republicans jeering at him. Biden was trying to make viral moments about, you know, still, this is like me versus Marjorie Taylor Greene versus this is me, the president nodding off at the podium. Let me run a clip by and get your reaction to it. Have you noticed Big Oil just reported his profits? record profits. Last year, they made $200 billion in the midst of a global energy crisis. I think it's outrageous. Why? 
They invested too little of that profit to increase domestic production. And when I talk to a couple of them, they say, well, we're afraid you're going to shut down all the oil wells and all the uh, oil refineries anyway, so why should we invest in them? I said, we're going to need oil for at least another decade. And that's going to exceed <laughs> and beyond that. We're going to need it. Was that the inside voice getting out? Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of, uh, I mean, look, clearly they, I mean, I would think that that's a good deal of that was probably scripted, but, uh, you know, as these speeches generally are scripted and vetted by staff, but, um, yeah, I mean, the idea that, that, oh, we're only going to need oil for 10 more years, first of all, is, is ludicrous. <laughs> even if, even if you're the kind of person who thinks, by gosh, we really, you know, have an urgent need to get rid of, uh, oil. Uh, and we need to replace everything with electric vehicles and all. It's just, it's not, it's not feasible. It's not, 10 years is not going to work. But the idea that, that the president and his administration are thinking in terms of the oil industry as a thing that's only going to last for 10 more years is precisely why people aren't investing, you know, why, why people aren't investing more in the industry, particularly because, you know, they're not getting the kind of permitting uh, and approvals that that they would hope to get under you know under a, a more energy friendly administration what do you make of the and this is a constant refrain we've heard it for a long time but he's really started to beat down on it and that is the pay your fair share of taxes whether you're a corporation or these billionaires that he's helping to produce and the tax loopholes that he's been around to help create and sign off on and benefit from all of these things as I listen to it, I know the answers. I know what's going on behind there. But for the normal person that hears that, is it effective? Is it effective for the middle class American? I mean, you know, it, it on the one hand, it taps into kind of a general sentiment uh, that's out there. But, you know, I mean, look, I I, I forget what it was. It was the, a little while ago I was going through some the congressional record from like yeah, 1975 and, and there's Joe Biden saying exactly the same thing. <laughs> right. So it's like, you know, it, I mean, first of all, the Democrats say this no matter what the tax rates are. Right. So that it's, it's one of those things. I mean, you know, the voters, I think by now have kind of priced in the fact that no matter what the tax rates are, you're going to hear Republicans saying taxes are are too dang high and the Democrats saying, oh, you're rich aren't paying their fair share. It's, it's, it's kind of background noise. Like if you followed politics for, you know, once you've followed politics for about 10 years, you know that you're just going to keep hearing these messages. And, and, and yeah, there are times when they resonate more, uh, one message or the other, but people are familiar with the fact that, you know, Republicans, generally want to cut your taxes and the Democrats want to raise them. And they, you know, and they tend to focus their energy on, well, it's the rich aren't paying their fair share. All of, you know, the thing that the thing that undercuts it so much uh, is, you know, when you talk about things like Republicans were talking about the fair tax, right? A national sales tax, yeah, yeah. Um, switch to a national sales tax of so getting rid of the income tax, which I think is, is, you know, it's one of those things that it's sort of a nice, um, in theory, academic discussion thing, but it's it's terrible idea in practice and terrible, even worse politics. But but you know when you when you talk about a national sales tax instead of an income tax, the immediate response from Democrats is, well, that's a massive tax cut for the rich. And if you think about it, well, why is it a massive tax cut for the rich? I thought you're telling me the Dem the rich aren't paying very much in taxes. Well, you know they are. And and that's why that's why pretty much any change to the tax laws is immediately attacked as a massive tax cut for the rich because the rich are already paying a massive amount of taxes. When you, I want to shift gears, if you can, over to Sarah Huckabee Sanders' response, the governor of Arkansas. Um, you watched that too, I presume. You know, honestly, I didn't. Well, let's get into the I details. Did, I did then. not. Let, let's get into I did the not no, expect it to be uh, <laughs> to, to be terribly interesting and and. You know, I, I've watched enough of those responses to know that nothing good ever comes of them. And, and that's pretty much true, regardless of which party is giving them. I, I thought the one that was actually quite effective some years yeah. ago, and there is a lesson for this, um, although it obviously didn't help his career, was when Bob McDonald did it um, in like the Virginia, I think it might have been the Virginia General Assembly chamber or something, but he did it in front of a crowd. Right. Yes. And, and yeah. so often it's just it's just some politician even a really good politician yep. speaking into a camera alone and 
boy, unless you unless you really got a a really compelling kind of fireside chat kind of atmosphere, you're not going to compete with a guy talking to all the Congress. It is like doing a presentation during the COVID to, you know, 500 people and you're on Zoom, right? Like no one else is is clapping. You can't hear it. It's all muted. And you feel like you're in a room by yourself. It's got to be. I agree. I, I think that one thing Billy suggested is we ought to go to the 1980s laugh track or something, some sort of applause meter. At least then it makes something make sense. If there is a highlight. Yeah, and, at, you know, no, it's, it's people who are really good at like TV, maybe that would work with. Like I remember when Fred Thompson ran for president, he, he, he had these he did these little like, little YouTube clips he was doing. And those are very effective because Fred was a TV guy, right? A movie guy. So he was very comfortable in that setting where there's no feedback. But most politicians, they're accustomed to being in front of crowds. That's how you get elected. If there's a highlight and a low light to this, what are they? Um, I mean, I think the, I mean, you know, clearly one low light is, is, is the hooting and holler and back and forth between the president. And, you know, it, we've seen a, a degradation of the decorum in the house over the, the, you know, progression from Obama to Trump to Biden. And and it's clearly something that's happened from both parties. But I think it was a little new to have the president sort of yelling back at the at the crowd um, a, a bit. Now, you know, there's a there's a case to be made that that's actually an improvement because the constitutional design of the State of the Union is it, it's supposed to be the Congress and the president out on the carpet once a year to explain himself. And he can do that in writing or he can do it in person. But, you know, the dynamics of that all shifted with television. Um, I mean, for most of the 19th century, the president's just submitted a letter. Um, but, you know, I miss, so those I, I think that, <laughs> I miss those days. Yeah. And, you know, some of those letters, I mean, it's funny you go back and read some of them now because they're like, I mean, the letter would still be read aloud in the Congress, actually. But, um, you know, they, they, they would be like pages of figures. And, and you know, here's here's because it, it was like a budget report. It was a big part of it. Um, but. So I think there's an upside and a downside to that. I think it is it is a little sad to see the kind of decline, but it, you know it it also is a little bit more democratic, a small d democratic in the sense that like sort of the way the British House of House of Commons is when the Prime Minister stands there and they're all screaming at him. Oh yeah, yeah. And that's just you know that's the way the British do it. They're like, well, if we wanted dignity, we'd have the king in here, but you're just the <laughs> Prime Minister, so right. you know we get you get you get yelled at like the rest of us. Dan, um, there is a poll out there, CNN poll ticket for what it's worth. 72% of those who watched in this poll thought it was favorable, positive, and that includes 43% of Republicans. How and why is that possible? I think there's a disconnect between the audience and the pundits uh, on a State of the Union. And this happens, again, year in and year out, regardless of which party. Uh, ordinary citizens who are not paid to watch presidential speeches. Um, among them, the people who tune into the State of the Union tend disproportionately to be people who like the president uh, and are willing to sit through the president talking for an hour and a half. Uh, whereas on the pundit side, it tends to be the opposite, right? The people who really pay attention to the State of the Union mostly are the people, um, you know, who are, who are in the business of criticizing the president. Not always. I mean, people do, people do listen uh, you know, if you're like an activist and engaged in some particular issue, you like want to listen Maddow. and be like, right, well, <laughs> well, yeah, but like if you're, you know, like if, if, if your cause, right, is is electric vehicles, say, right, you want to listen very carefully. Oh, is the president going to talk about electric vehicles? Like, yes. you know, that's that's the sort of thing you want to make sure that that the that it's a signal that this is where the president's going to put his energy over the next year. Dan, last question before we cut you loose to go back to that Eastern time zone. Uh, you said you went to school in North Jersey. I presume that means you had to carry a switchblade to class. No, no, no. This is, this is the eight this is Catholic school in the eighties. So uh, it's a little, little, little different, little different world, but a crucifix with a pop out knife, some sort of something to protect you from <laughs> the rest of the community. You know, it was it was it was a different it was a different it's uh, it's Bergen County. So Dan McLaughlin from Nashville View. Buddy, I've enjoyed the interview. I hope you're willing to come back on and tell us about more of what you're writing about. 
Oh, anytime, anytime. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Dan. Hey, uh, I, I love that interview, getting that sort of uh, national perspective outside the state of Colorado. I love that stuff. Here's something else I love. Valentine's Day is coming up and you still have a chance to be a hero to the one that you love the most. And, and you know what? Here's how you do it. Get in the car, drive out to Littleton Jewelry. It's just south of Hudson Gardens, and that's right off of Santa Fe there. We're really close to Arapahoe Community College. Very convenient whether you're going to come south from Hamden, uh, which is 285, or north from 470. You just turn turn right, right after that jewelry repair sign. You go in there, and you say hi to Jesse and the rest of the team that's in there. They're big 710 listeners and lovers. And here's what they're going to do for you. It's not just the standard jewelry stuff, the stuff that you get in those big box stores in the mall. It's not just that. It's not just the buying and the selling of the gold and the silver, platinum, jewelry, gemstones, coins. It's not all that stuff. If Yeah, fix your watch. I get it. That's all fantastic stuff, and they do it at a very high level. It's the custom jewelry. That's the And they've expanded into the space next to them because that part of the business has really taken off. You still have time to do something magical for that person that you love. And so unique, it lives on past you, past them. It's the kind of thing they pass down to that next generation and someone that they care about. Not something you can get on Amazon or at the mall. Something you can only get from Littleton Jewelry. Go explore that. You can check them out at littletonfinejewelry.com. Littletonfinejewelry.com. But honestly, the best thing to do is to get in the car, drive over there, tell them you're a 710 listener. They'll scream back, we are, do we love it? And then let us know how awesome it goes on Valentine's Day. And for saving your relationship, you are welcome. We're going to come back. Don and others still calling in at 303-696-1971. Your thoughts on the State of the Union address. And Hera, oh boy, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the governor from Arkansas, her response, 303-696-1971. George Brock on the George Show, 710 KNUS.
Such engaged and funny texters. Um, here's one. I'm Joe from Arvada, and I love the State of the Union address. I wrote back, I don't believe you. Uh, that is completely legitimate. Now, listen, we want to honor someone who's been on hold since about three this morning. Don from Lakewood, you're on 710. Don, what did you think about that State of the Union address? Well, I was waiting for you to get up at five to start out with. <laughs> I get up way before five, my friend. So do I. What'd you think? Uh, I think it was pretty much par for the course. The vitriol that you're seeing a little more openly, I think, is just kind of a natural progression in how these are going to go. Um, the people are angry. They're fed up with the media. It just, I think, is pretty much a tell of where things are really at in this country. They can spin and lie and spin and lie, but you know, what's changed? We went from 600 million or 600, what do you say, 600 to 1,000 billionaires in this country? Since he took office, that's Biden. what he says in his yeah. term. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, good for Joe, but that's only 1,000 people out of how many people in this country? Several thousand. Uh, yeah, a few hundred thousand. <laughs> right. So, you know, this, this, this tax, the rich thing, you know, that's some validity to it in some respects, but, you know, they set the rules, they set the rules for themselves and to throw all this out all the time. Well, um, Don, Don, you've hit the nail on the head there. It's not legit, this tax, the rich thing, because one, they created the tax code to get the result that they wanted. You can't then go after corporations and individuals for actually following the law and using the tax code. Now, when he talks about things like, hey, we need to find tax cheats, I'm good with that. I'm good with tax cheats. My problem is, Don, they're not going to focus on those billionaires. They've hired so many damn IRS agents, they're going to need to stay busy, and they stay busy looking into Don's finances and Billy's and George's. You remember what Trump told Hillary it's your system. I just play in it. Yeah, that's it's true, fair. man. That was a no, that was a real act of candor there in 2016. You're right. Well, that, you know, he nailed it on the spot. He'd be a fool not to. Anyone would be a fool not to use the tax codes. I do. I'm sure you do. I use them you know, poorly, you, as it turns out. But here, here's well, the you need a better you need a better accountant. The other maybe. thing is when you start talking about people dodging taxes, there is a whole culture of people in this country who operate under the radar, a lot of cash, probably part of the impetus on getting rid of currency and going to totally digital. And then they can say, George, by the way, you don't need that item you're trying to purchase. So we're not going to honor your digital currency. Now, you think about that in the long term. Don, and you you, at- you started off by talking about the vitriol, and I presume what you're talking about are those members of Congress, including Marjorie Taylor Greene, who yelled some stuff out. Um, is that okay with you? And I get it; people are upset. Oh, I, people- I don't, I, I, I don't care. This country, uh, in the beginning, uh, they, 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 I think they even went and dueled one time. Was it Hamilton and somebody else? Is- dueled over something political i mean well yeah but maybe this thing is not as a result of the house of congress what is what is is civility george you know good for thee but not for me no no i think it's i think it's paying the respect to the person who's given the speech to let them complete and then you ask your questions or you say your rebuttal or whatever but historically at least in my lifetime that's the way it's been my concern is that we're getting to a place where we're going to excuse the kind of behavior that leads to worse behavior. That's what I don't like. And I don't think any of it advances the cause of communication. Well, you have a valid point there, but you know, you're going to have to go back a ways just with media, advertising, television programming that, you know, are blatant disregard for civility, law and order and everything else. I mean, this mentality didn't just happen overnight. So and it's do, been fueled and profited on. Do you want to see more of it or less of it? I don't really care. Why not? Because I, I, well, number one, I'm not going to be able to change anything. It is going to be what it's going to be. I behave myself in what I consider to be a, a civil person. I can go from zero to 100. You say the wrong thing. 
but typically I keep a lid on all that, um, you know, and just treat people the way you want to be treated. That doesn't play out for everybody. You and I have talked before in person. You know my demeanor, kind of attitude I kind of have. I mean, I'm, I can be aggressive if I need to, and I can be as gentle as they come. So, Don, I, I don't, I don't think it's a big concern. I, I do, I, think it's just I do, be, because I, I think it is a symptom of a further deteriorating political environment. Start? Yeah, I, I, don't, start? I don't think it well, starts there. I don't well, think it starts there, but it reinforces the idea that there are no rules to even the way we conduct ourselves in a place like the U S house of representatives, as long as our, as long as our, our reasoning is high minded, like this is about lies or this is about the future of America. If we can just say those things, then there are no limits to the things we can do to each other. Respectful, disrespectful kind of doesn't matter as long as our goals are the right goals. And I don't believe that. My mom taught school for 35 years, elementary school. OK, and there was a progression between the 60s and 70s to 80s where there was a gradual disrespect, the inability for the schools to discipline. Um, she couldn't spank a kid, heaven forbid, though earlier in her career she was able to. And this has been going on, and I beg to differ with you that I think a lot of this has been started out at a very young age. I think a lot of it is fueled by what kids see, um, even video games of violence and just all the things that you don't want to have in real life. How's a kid going to know the difference? It, it know? may your, be there. It may be a parenting change. Your kids talk back to you? Uh, no, but um, not Did in a disrespectful way. I, I don't know how to describe it. Not in a disrespectful way. Um, you know, like okay. I encourage them to let me know what they think about this that, or the other, but if the tone changes or something, I let them know, but that, that starts early. And I, how do you discipline? It's usually choking. No, I'm kidding. I don't, uh, I, at this point in their age, it is not so much how I discipline at this moment as their memory of how I disciplined in the past. <laughs> you know what I mean? So if dad says something like, Hey, I'm not your buddy, I'm not your peer, I'm your dad. That's usually enough right there. I hear you. Hey, Don, well, Don, I, I got to let you go because I open and watch. Good chatting please, with you. Please do. Good, good, good chatting, Don. Thanks for the phone call. I want to get to some more of the calls here. Don's line is open at 303-696-1971. Jim's is not because he's on it. Jim, you're on 710. What do you think? Uh, good morning, George. How are you? Doing well. Um, listen, you know, when I think of the State of the Union, I think of a like a, a 5,000 foot level of talking about America. And I can't believe that I had a president discussing airlines and baggage and hotel and these fees and stuff like that in this whole conversation. I thought he brought this thing down to such a minute level. Um, and, and sort of talking about inflation, because everybody wants to hear about how we're going to get inflation under control. He never really touched on that. He never touched about kind of what's going on in our concerning the southern border where we have 3 million people cross that we have no idea about and our fentanyl which is like the number one killer of kids under 14 never really touched on those issues which are issues that are what i really want to know our federal government's doing and he never did because he has no answers and the answers he has are actually probably more of a problem than a solution to the problem i thought it was a failure from that point of view i thought that he should have been talking more at a higher level and he didn't because he didn't have any answers it was a real disappointment i would say and so i didn't even stay and listen to sarah how much how much did you listen to of the state of the union well i i listened to probably more than half of it um i was just kind of intriguing because i, I was to be honest with you i i was wondering whether it was going to be a train going off the rails because I have. Yeah, OK, so, case. Jim, Let's Jim, I, I love the call for a lot of reasons, but that one in particular, because I think a lot of people were like rubbernecking this event, like, will he fall off the stage or will he make pee pee or something like that? Like, will they have to, like, come mm -hmm. back and put a battery in or something like that? I think a lot of people mm -hmm. were doing that. And I think that worked to his advantage because the bar was so low when he didn't do it. People were like, oh, OK, Joe's back. Right. Yeah, I would say that's true. I think that's very true from the aspect of wanting to see where, where he made mistakes. 
Jim, when you, and, when you heard the yelling and stuff, did, did, how does that strike you? I'd ask Don about that too. I mean, it, it bothers me and the people that are doing it. So I, I like these people, but I, the, the idea that there is an environment like that, where you get to scream out to interrupt the president, whether it's DJT or Biden or whoever follows, I'm not sure that makes us better. You know, I'll just say this: the whole decorum has gone, really gone downhill. I would say the, uh, you know, the split standing up and all that of half of the half of the house standing up and the other half is. Yeah. You know what that reminds me of? I got to tell you, I really got to tell you. It reminds me of the old days of the Soviet Union, looking at Stalin when he was giving his speeches, and what was going on. It was looked like a bunch of clamping seals. And to to be honest with you, the State of the Union has no relevance to me anymore because it looks like it's more of a show than a, a substance. Oh, it's performative that's, for that's sure. The thing about it. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just sad. It's just really sad. And, uh, you know, the, that's why I think the whole reason I watched was to see if he would fall on his face. And he didn't. So he, 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 gave, he basically passed that by. <laughs> but I don't think uh, anyone comes away saying, yeah, I feel better going forward. Yeah, I agree with that. He's an idiot. I, yeah. I don't believe it one damn bit. And it didn't answer what's going on with our country concerning our real ills concerning inflation and concerning the poisoning of our kids that wasn't addressed and i don't think they want to touch well and you can tell when he, when he tried to talk about fentanyl people were yelling out they were yelling out the border the border you know they were trying to inject that into his speech so i think they were highlighting what you said and that is th- mm-hmm. this is not an effective way to communicate to america what the real problems are yeah Exactly right. Exactly what what the yields are, and they didn't do it one darn bit. And it's really sad because he had he had an opportunity to address it, saying what we're doing going forward, and he didn't because he doesn't have an answer to this. But I'll tell you what: as more kids die, I think more Americans are going to be more relevant. I have to have conversations. My kids are in college. I don't have conversations on my kids concerning their grades. I have to have every time. Are you going to a party this week? Make sure if there's party there, you're not taking anything that you don't know about. This is never, I never in my wildest dreams, I thought I would have that conversation concerning college. I have to do it every time because every time I turn on the radio, I hear about another kid that's died. Jim, thanks. One other thing as I let you go, and thank you for the phone call and the conversation is, if you get a chance, listen to the Sarah Huckabee Sanders response. It's much shorter, obviously, than the presidential one. First, take a look and see how she does it. But listen to it. There's some important things in there because these are going to be issues and platform positions. My sense is moving forward. And Sarah Huckabee Sanders, impressive. She's the youngest governor in the country, first woman governor of Arkansas. She's got a future in the party. It's worth listening to how she does this particular response. Uh, Now, everybody else that's calling in right now, and I can see some phone lines lit up here, I will get to you after the break, but not until I tell you about your teeth. Oh, yeah, that's right, your teeth. They're right in there in your mouth, which is the gatekeeper to health for you. Whatever is going on in your mouth is going to impact the rest of your body. So why not take care of it the way I do? I go to Twin Aspen Dental Center. These are the good folks. You know them as doctors Richter and Snyder. Great people, super gentle, super knowledgeable. They put you at ease. I've got to go back in there. I got to look at the calendar. I think it's this month or next to go have them look under the hood and kick the tires and remind me that I have a really weird tooth that is completely twisted around. Um, And then I fall asleep there. Uh, Shiloh took care of me last time. Maybe she'll do it this time. And I just nodded off. It's a good time to catch up on Z's while you're getting your dental health cared for. But here's the other cool thing. They have a reduced fee dental membership plan. So despite whatever the president said about how great the economy is going, you may not be feeling it. I'm not. This whole thing includes two cleanings, two routine exams, all necessary x-rays. I hope you don't need it, but one emergency exam and a fluoride application for the children under the age of 18 and 25% off all dental services. All of that in one program. You got to call these folks and find out what it takes to get it. 303-841-7466-303. 8417466 or you can go check them out at twinaspendentalcenter.com twinaspendentalcenter.com or go down Parker Road right by Stro right there by Layman Academy and check them out just go in and say hi and they'll talk you through it they're just such nice people hey listen when we come back your texts your calls george george show 710 you know the letters can you ask 